We really care what the Bible says. We want you to prove all things. You can call in and ask a question on truth with Prue. Oh, will you go mute that? <laughs> Hey, thanks for joining in tonight. Yes, we are going to have a live debate tonight on truth with proof. If, again, if uh, my audio is not coming across, make sure, or if it's real low, make sure you can text me at 931-267-9095. I'll go ahead and pull the phone number up there at the very beginning. So just in case uh, you can't hear either one of us, you make sure you always text us to let us know you can't, uh, there's something going on with the audio, and that way... You, we can make the corrections. So tonight, I am having a live debate with Tim. Uh, he came all the way in from Nashville. What is that, about an hour? Hour 20. Yeah. Hour and 20 minutes away. So I do appreciate, I yeah, got a message said we're coming across good. So I appreciate Tim for making the effort, the zeal he has to come an hour and 20 minutes to discuss this subject tonight. So what we're going to do is I'm going to briefly go over the, our format that we're going to have. And then he's going to be opening with uh, his 15-minute opening. So again, we're going to have a 15-minute opening. Tim's going to affirm uh, the proposition is, are there true Christians in multiple denominations, right? Right. All right, so he's going to take 15 minutes and affirm that. I'm going to take 15 minutes and deny that. And then he's going to take 10 minutes and affirm that or answer some arguments or however he wants to. But... He's more in the affirmative, and then I'm going to have 10 minutes in the negative to refute what he brings up, any new arguments. Then we're going to have a short, maybe about a five-minute uh, break. We probably won't use the whole five minutes. It'll be more about just getting our equipment prepared for the next part of the debate. And then we're going to have 20 minutes of asking each other questions. So we're both going to be up here. We're going to show respect. We're going to be cordial. And we're going to just ask each other questions back and forth. Um, I'm going to try to run the time. There's just me and him here, so it's going to be a little difficult to try to make sure about the time of the questions and the response time. We did uh, agree kind of that the question would be one minute and your response would be two minutes. But I'm sure we'll kind of go, uh, we'll work that out. I mean, I think we'll both respect one another. And then I'm going to have 20 minutes asking questions to Tim. And then basically we're going to have five minutes closing remarks. And then for you viewers, we are going to open up the phone lines at the end. Don't be calling <laughs> during our uh, speaking. Uh, we'll have 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, we're not going to allow just to call in and preach to us in that, okay? Uh, but we are going to allow you to call in, ask a question to whoever you want to ask the question to, and that person actually, like if you call in and you ask me a question, I'm going to be allowed to ask you questions back or give you an answer. And we're just going to have like an open format with the callers, not just you call in and ask a question and I answer it. However you want, you can at least stay on the line for maybe we'll say a minute or two for each caller and uh, we can go back and forth. So if he says something that you're interested in, you have a question with, you call, you ask Tim and he can ask you a question upon his answer, or he can answer it and, and then open up with another question with you. And if you are a caller and you really, if you uh, don't like that necessarily, you're a caller, so you can just hang up. I mean, you don't really have to sit on the phone line. If you get nervous or scared yep. or whatever, just click. We're not gonna ask you your name, and uh, that's kind of the format. We thought that would be more for the viewers who really are interested in seeking truth and reasoning from the scriptures. So uh, I'm going to, Tim's going to have 15 minutes. You can see on the screen, I'm going to go ahead and go behind the scene here. He's going to start his first 15 minutes. Whoop. There we and go. Uh, let me pull this up just in case you do want to. Oh, and you might be asking why we, we kind of have a different background. You want to explain why? Yeah, because we, we were both in the Army. Uh, Travis served in Iraq with the 25th Infantry Division, right. and I served in Afghanistan with the uh, 10th Mountain. So something we shared in common, so just a, a fun commonality there for the background.
Corey, if you do want to use that. Do you want me to close that out? Or it's fine. I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to fool with it. Okay, let me get the timer for you. And go ahead and hit start. All right. Good evening, everyone. First, I'd like to extend thanks to Travis tonight for opening his home. I, br I brought him a gift. I gave it to him before we started the show. Uh, and he, he gave me a gift as well that I look forward to reading several books, actually. I gave him a MacArthur Study Bible as a token of my thanks for the invitation and the trust that he extended to me by opening his home and his studio to me for this occasion. Though Travis and I have had exchanges of different types over the past year and a half or so, this is, in fact, the first time that we've actually met in person. Uh, and secondly, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this debate on your Saturday night, whether you're watching it tonight live or some point in the future when you could be watching Netflix or HBO or literally anything else. My hope for tonight is that regardless of the outcome, God will be glorified and Christ's body edified by this engagement. Now, before I get into the meat of tonight's topic, there are some things I need to clarify. You may hear the term Campbellism or Campbellite used this evening, and by no means is this intended to be used as an offensive term. I simply wish to apply the same standard of language that Travis uses to judge other churches by and apply it to his own tradition. Secondly, uh, it is of no importance tonight whether someone considers me a Baptist or not. The Baptist church is not synonymous with Christ's universal church. I see that Travis has already begged the question of sorts by, in, uh, in the description of the video, I believe he describes me as a Baptist and himself as a member of the Lord's Church, but that's really why we're here tonight. I also hope that we can save time by not debating about whether Christ is his head and Christ established his church back in the days of the Bible, because of course we all agree. Now, on some Saturdays, in between juggling family life, work, and school, you may find me with a group of other Christians in downtown Nashville in Centennial Park. One of the neat things about these outreaches is that all of the evangelists that come out come from different churches. In fact, people we often uh, encounter ask, what church are you all from? And I truly appreciate this question, and my response usually looks something like this. Well, we are all actually from a handful of different churches. I go to Hermitage Hills Baptist Church, and my friend Miles over there goes to a Presbyterian. John here goes to a non-denominational one. But the reason we can all come out here together is because our unity and the authority of Scripture, reverence for the triune God of the Bible, and our salvation by grace alone through faith alone. Which leads me to tonight's topic, which I'm affirming. There are true Christians in multiple denominations. There are two avenues that I will explore with you this evening, primarily around the doctrine of the church. First, what is the doctrine of the church? And secondly, what are the real-life implications of this important doctrine? You see, the reason why doctrine is so important is because our beliefs and positions on doctrine, whether we acknowledge them or not, have direct applications and implications on how we live out our Christian walk. To begin, we simply need to define the word church. Ecclesia from the Greek simply means called out ones. But that word, ecclesia or church, is used in two distinguishing ways. The first we will address and define is that of the universal church. We can define the universal church as being made up of all regenerate Christians from Bible days to the present, those who are already in heaven and those who are still living, all who come to saving faith. There are four particular passages in which the universal church is demonstrated. The first is Matthew 16, 18, where Christ speaks. I also say to you that you are Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church. That is Christ's church. Again in Ephesians 1, And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills in all. Again, that is Christ as being the head over his church. Also in Ephesians, this time in chapter 4, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. And finally, in Colossians 1.18, he is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the head, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. So, we can establish at least two things from this passage, these passages. First, that Christ established his church, and second, Christ is the head over all of it. 
Furthermore, in Matthew 16, Christ continues to state that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. From this passage in Matthew, we can see that the church, and contrary to the attitudes of some, is in fact on the offensive, and that it will not be stopped by Satan and those enslaved to him. This part of scripture serves as a particular problem for my opponent tonight and his religious tradition, as you will see demonstrated in just a moment. The second and distinct expression we see of the ecclesia in the New Testament is reference towards what we would call the local church. These local bodies are assemblies of believers with distinct leadership, mutual commitments, and with a recognized membership. Unlike the universal body, the local church will be a mixture of true Christians and those, simply, those who are simply professed believers. The context helps us to determine whether or not the author is referring to the universal body or the local church. For example, we have geographical context in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. This is talking about a concentrated group of believers. In 1 Corinthians 1, 2, it says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. In Galatians 1, 2, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches, in, uh, the churches of Galatia. And finally, in 1 Thessalonians 1, 1, which is a particularly interesting phrasing to it, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Paul gets even more specific in Romans 16, verses 1 and 5, when he writes, I commend to you, Sister Phoebe, who is servant of the church, which is at Centraea. And also in verse 5, also greet the church that is in their house. We can infer from the text that these are specific, identifiable bodies of Christian that would have their own leadership, mutual commitments, and members, as we've mentioned before. These churches, some being made up of Jewish converts in Jerusalem, some being made up of Celtic pagan converts in Galatia, would certainly not have been identical in image nor practice. Scripture actually gives us a biblical example of some of these cultural distinctions. In Acts chapter 21, where Paul gives a report to the church in Jerusalem after he returned from one of his missionary journeys, he presents this to the elders. And after the elders hear his update, they rejoice and immediately glorify God. But they present Paul with an area of concern. Acts 21 reads, you see, my brothers, this is the elders talking to Paul. You see, my brother, how, how many thousands there are among the Jews who have believed. They are zealous for the law, and they have been told about you that you teach all, that, you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. And then they tell Paul, do, what, well, do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself among with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus, all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. And continuing in verse 26, then Paul took them in and the next day he purified himself along with them. These are the ceremonial laws under the law of Moses and went into the temple, giving notice that when the days of purification would be fulfilled, and the offspring presented for each one of them. You see, this church in Jerusalem would have certainly been very different in practice as compared to the churches in the Gentile regions. Now, to be sure here, Paul and the elders of the Jerusalem church were not encouraging, were not saying that you had to obey the law of Moses in order to be saved. That is the problem we see addressed by the Judaizers in Galatians 1. But what he was telling them was that if they wanted to continue to obey the law of Moses, they were free to do so. Now, as we mentioned before, in regards to Christ and his church, we have Christ's assurance that it would never fall away. And as I mentioned, this was a particular problem for Travis. Let me now fill you in on why that is. I assert that history demonstrates that the Church of Christ in doctrine and practice, as Travis recognizes it, did not exist prior to 1811. Alexander Campbell and his father Thomas Campbell, along with their associates, Walter Scott and Barton Stone, founded the movement and religious tradition that we recognize today as the Church of Christ. These men, simply put, believed that all the churches around them had fallen away from New Testament Christianity. 
Campbell and Stone even claimed to recover the gospel of water baptism. These men knew of no other church that they believed to be totally aligned with the first century church. Nor could Travis demonstrate that any true church, in his perspective, and true Christian, again, in his perspective, existed between the first century and 1811. My opponent tonight must uniquely contend with the concept of church restoration in two ways. His first option is to recognize that his religious tradition, in this case the Church of Christ, but also including the Disciples of Christ and several other splinter groups, were founded by the efforts of Alexander Campbell and his cohorts in an attempt to bring the church back to the way they believed more closely aligned with biblical Christianity. But the universal church itself was never in need of a full restoration. This is a position I certainly could have respect for, as would many churches of Christ that are more grace-leaning would likely affirm. Or second, and as Campbell himself claimed, that Campbell restored the true gospel to the world and thereby the church, indicating that Christ's church had fallen away entirely and was in need of a total restoration and re-establishment. Travis cannot have both. The first option would align him in an ecumenical fashion with myself and other churches that while they have some differences, still hold, which hold each other within the brotherhood of Christian fellowship. The second places Travis in the same camp as other restorationist claims of the 19th century, such as the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Adventists, etc. While we can anticipate that Travis will quickly deny the first option, he will be confronted tonight with a hard reality of the second. Namely, that Travis's own tradition cannot stand up to the same standard that he applies to other churches. As an honest examination of, of history traces Travis's doctrine back to a man. This is particularly important over his constant accusations of other denominations being founded by men, why his and his alone is founded by Christ, as he will claim. If you have watched Travis's show for any length or those like him, you will recognize that he possesses a sort of historylessness or almost a total unwillingness to confront or contend with his own history. Anytime he's questioned on it, Travis has jumped from today to the founding of the church to the New Covenant Church in Jerusalem and never discusses anything in between. So why do I bring this up? As I stated in the beginning of this opening, doctrine is important because it has real-life applications and implications. And Travis refuses to contend with the true-to-life implications of his own views on the doctrine of the church. In conclusion, and for clarification, here is my summary. Number one, Christian unity is found and shared between any believer who believes that we are saved by grace through faith and not by baptism, church attendance, Bible reading, proper worship, or any of the other 1,000 things that Travis would require for salvation. And number two, Travis will be pressed tonight on the implications of his doctrine of the church. There is little to no room for disagreement on doctrine of virtually any kind in his mind. As such, Travis will be asked to demonstrate that in his view, and in accordance with his doctrine, that the church did not, in fact, fall away and need a restoration, which would be completely contrary to the claims of the founders of Travis' movement, which I'm also prepared to demonstrate tonight. And with that, I will hand it over to Travis. Just a minute here to set up my 15 minutes. going. All right, we're going to examine some things about why I'm denying denominations are claiming to be true Christians because as you can see upon the screen, denominations 
they deny the blood of Jesus. Yes, friends, they actually deny the precious blood of Jesus. And we're going to look at why. You know, denominations is really just sectarian groups. As uh, the Bible says, there's the sect of the Pharisees, and I'm going to go through this pretty quick, but the sect of the Sadducees down here in Acts 5, 7, and even in the first century, the enemies of the Apostle Paul would even claim that the Apostle Paul was a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes down here. Now, we understand the first century church wasn't some sectarian group. It was the church that Christ said he was going to build in Matthew 16, 18. But Tim is doing the same thing down here, making the claim that I'm some kind of part of a denomination, that the, the church that I'm a member of was established by some man. Sectarians basically, again, are denominations. You see men, a body of men following their own tendence, basically what they come up with. Just like the Sadducees believe certain things, the Pharisees believe certain things, just like he even stated to when he's evangelizing at the park, people ask, well, what church do you guys go to? Why don't he just say, well, what church should we be a member of? There's only one in the Bible. You don't read about what he was saying, that the, the, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Presbyterian, and, and I'm a Methodist. If, if someone read their Bible and someone come up to that, them and said, well, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that, I'd be like, well, none of that's in the Bible. What are you guys making these denominations up that aren't even, not even in the Word of God, friends? And we see the definition here, conflicts arising from di diversity of opinions. See, if he was evangelizing me at a park, I'd say, Tim, you say you're a Baptist and you're a Methodist. Well, you believe in immer immersion, dunking in water, and you name the church after a work that, that you don't even believe that's essential, and then you, a Methodist, over here sprinkling. That's real unity. Yeah, that's the one baptism in Ephesians 4, verse 5, where it talks about unity. Yeah, that's real unity. And then we see the, the, uh, a definition of denominationalism is a branch of the Christian church, a branch. I'm not a branch. I'm part of the whole tree. I'm part of the true church that you read about in the Bible. Notice this. These guys, they, they won't even give the glory to Jesus. Our Lord was undenominational. So must his church be. Our Lord did not align himself when we see are these sectarian groups, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Rhodians, the Essens. Jesus didn't have no part of all that division. That is not unity. That is the opposite, and that's what you see in all these denominations. True, there are true Christians in multiple denominations. That's what he's trying to promote. Well, first off, what is a Christian? Well, in Acts 26, 28, then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Agrippa knew some of he believed some of it, but he didn't obey it, just like them. They believe a little bit. They'll, he'll get up and say, he'll say Jesus. As I, I wrote down, he said, The church are um, the called out. We'll look at that. But he said they're called out by grace through faith alone. Gr by grace through faith alone. Friends, that's not in the Bible. That's not a Christian. That's his own man-made tradition, just like the sectarian Jews that you read about in your New Testament. Here we have the ecclesia, the church, the calling out. Don't, I don't disagree much with what he's saying there. It's, it is the called out. They're called out of this world. But the, how he's defining the called out, it's by these manuals I have over here on the side, as you see on my show, these man-made creed books and confessions of faith. We're going to look at, this is Tim, this is what he's basically saying. Now over here, you have the called, he says, uh, the called out ones, which I agree, but look at 2 Thessalonians 2.14, where unto he called you by our gospel. Friends, the Bible, the gospel, he called us by the gospel. You cannot read in the gospel of what these denominations are saying to be saved. That's the bottom line. That is how we would de determine what a Christian is, someone who, obey, who obeys the gospel. Notice, this is, this is Tim, and he's saying, well, you got the Baptist over here, a little group, and you got Life Church with that. And then over here, you got the Jehovah Witnesses. See, they're a denomination. And then over here, you got the Mormons. Like he actually made a claim that I'm somewhat connected to the Mormon church 
and the Mormons use a whole different book called the Book of Mormons, and I'm up here saying, I only use the Bible. The Bible alone is the final authority. Not even close to the Mormons. And then you have the denominations of the Catholics and the Presbyterians. This is what Tim is promoting. All teaching different things, and then he's on YouTube, and I've got him, I can play him. He is basically saying the Mormons need to hear the true gospel. And another Baptist I got on my show saying the Jehovah Witnesses are not going to be saved. So there is a contradiction within his own uh, promoting of all these denominations because he's going to say, well, they don't really believe Jesus. Well, oh, so everybody's not going to go to heaven, Tim. And see, that's what it comes down to. A lot of you are closed-minded when you hear there's one church. Well, Tim got up and talked about one church. But he's just trying to say, it's just a bunch of different people teaching all this different stuff and can't even get salvation right. Friends, there's one group of people, the church is not the building, and it is the Christians who are called out by the gospel, not these creed books. Well, some of this I'm going to go through a little quick because he talked about how there's one body. Ephesians 4, 4 says there's one body. And the church, which is his body. All right, so denominations, they deny the saving blood. That's why there's no Christians in denominations. Ephesians 5.23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Now, who is Jesus going to save? Well, we see the church and the body is the same. He's only going to save his church. And his church is not all of these people being saved by grace through faith alone when his word contradicts that and says you're not saved by faith alone. So again, one body which is the body? His body, which is his church, the church of Christ. I mean, man, if you just had some little bit of common sense, you drove down the road, he drove an hour and 20 minutes here, you think he drove by these denominations where it says Grandma's Church, Life Church, Baptist Church, Methodist Church, Presbyterian Church, Church of Christ? You mean those people actually want to be uh, affiliated with being described as the church of Jesus Christ and they act like they give God the glory in Jesus? Ephesians 1 7 in whom we have redemption through his blood again they deny redemption is salvation remission forgiveness of sins that's synonym same thing they deny the blood of Jesus Revelation 1 5 washed us from our sins in his own blood denominations deny the blood because they deny his church. Look at Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. That's what I'm a member of. The church of God and the church of Christ is one and the same. Open your Bibles up and read, read about that. Look, which he had purchased with his own blood. See, he had purchased his church, the church of Christ. Notice this timeline you would have the first century church and he would even probably agree that it happened in Acts chapter 2 that's where the church of Christ was established and then you have until 325 you kind of have where the church was starting to fall away you see this timeline here the church of Christ right here in Acts chapter 2 their terms let me pull that up their terms you know he talks about Alexander Campbell I mean, and I've got something that he's going to be shocked at here in a little bit. I've been holding it for about three months. <clears throat> All right, this is Acts chapter 2. For you guys who don't study a lot, Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost. And you notice when the church was established right here on the day of Pentecost, and Peter said to them, no, I'm sorry, Alexander Campbell said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, for salvation. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, Peter said to them, faith alone for your salvation. No, you guys can see it. This is so simple. But see, you guys are brainwashed like some of these Pharisees and Sadducees. The word of God doesn't matter to you guys. This is what the terms were to be entered into the church to be added. Because look, that day, there were some that was gladly received the word. Now, I've debated two individuals, one of them in person, 
and he was promoting faith only, and now he believes that uh, you have to be baptized, at least that's what he's sharing on Facebook, but he left this local denomination, and now he's a orthodox, uh, ortho I forget what they call it, or what is orthodox, uh, basically like a Catholic. Well, because when we debated, he started seeing, well, I mean, there's one church. But then he went to a denomination. See, you can't read about them in the Bible neither. It's so sad. But then here we have in Acts 2.41, some of those people gladly received the word. What was the word? Faith only? No, friends. Repent and be baptized. And I don't think Alexander Campbell was alive all the way back then. But back to the timeline, you have the churches of Christ throughout history. All right? Now he was talking about, this is his argument. Listen to his argument. Travis, here's the problem with Travis. Travis can't find his church, it's not mine, but he's referring, you can't find the churches of Christ before the 1800s. Well, what, well here, here's the argument back. Can you find anyone of, of the Baptist church teaching faith only from the Bible to today connecting with even what the Bible's teaching. See, at least I can go to the Bible and find repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. He can't even go to the Bible and find faith only where we're saved by that. So he thinks he's in some kind of better situation. Friends, I would like for him to go back to history and dig up when, that, when the Baptists come along. Because he's going to say, well, the Baptists come along maybe in the 1600s. Well, that's not first century. See, friends, I can go all the way back to the Bible. He thinks he's in a better situation just because I can't pull up some kind of secular history. See, the Bible isn't enough for these guys. See right here on the pages of the Bible, the churches of Christ. Now, he ain't going to find the Baptist church, and he thinks he's in a better situation than I am. And then you have 606 about the Catholic church breaking off. Look. Friends, they, they're, no new, they're not Christians in denominations because they deny the New Testament. Romans 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than being now justified by His blood, they deny that. What do you mean that they deny that? They deny the terms of how you contact the blood. Hebrews 10, 29. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who had trodden under the foot the Son of God, and I counted the blood of the covenant wherein he was sanctified, the blood of the covenant, Matthew 26, 28, for this is the blood, this is my blood of the New Testament. They deny the New Testament. What do you mean? They deny the terms of even salvation. Look, they deny, I'm going to end with this. They deny the remission of sins. Look at Luke 24. I think, is that your water you said you were I was going to drink his water. In Luke 24, 46 through 47, And then said unto them, Thus it is written, Thus it is behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. See, they say, Oh, I believe that. I believe that. And notice this, And repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name beginning at Jerusalem. They deny the remission of sins because they deny his authority, his name, and they deny the beginning place. Look here at Acts 2. It began in Jerusalem. These guys said, what do we do? Alexander C Campbell said, I'm sorry. I meant Peter, the inspired apostle, actually moved by the Holy Spirit. So God said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. They deny the remission of sins. Again, Luke 24, 46 again, it says in his name, meaning to do something by his authority, his permission, and they're not doing things by his name. They're doing things because, remember, he's a Baptist, he's a Methodist, he's a Presbyterian. None of them will even, I mean, are they not going to be Christians? Christians only close out with this. They deny the cleansing power of the blood in 1 John 1 7. Thank you guys for your time.
All right, guys, I hope you guys are having as much fun as we are. We are moving into our rebuttal period where we've each been given 10 minutes. I'll be rebutting Travis's opening, and he will be afforded 10 minutes to rebut mine. All right, go ahead. Let me get this off the screen. All right. Okay. Well, this is fun. I hope you guys are having fun. Uh, this is definitely an entertaining Saturday night. And again, I appreciate Travis's invitation and his um, energetic opening statement. So the first thing I want to clarify for everyone watching tonight, for, for those that are watching from Travis's side of this debate, is that I am not a universalist, and I want to clarify that. I believe that everyone is in need of saving grace by, by grace through faith through Jesus Christ. There is not a soul on the planet that is not in need of saving. And that it's only done through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number two, uh, my second point, I want to clarify this as well. Travis calls for unity and to be one and things like that, but his type of legalism cannot produce it, or if it does, only sustains it for a certain amount of time. In Travis's church, things split the church, such as can you use a pitch pipe? Is a pitch pipe authorized? Now, this may not have impacted his specific local congregation, but through these types of churches, they split them all the time. Can you use a pitch pipe? Is a pitch pipe authorized in worship? Can you build a kitchen onto the church building? These are real things that divide churches. How many cups should you use for communion? There's a term out there called one cuppers. There are kinds of churches of Christ that only use one cup because that's the way that that's the pattern that they read in New Testament. Therefore, they are only authorized for a single cup. Now, I don't I don't think Travis is, is of that kind. But when you have this mindset that everything that is commanded in the New Testament, everything that is commanded by God is hinged upon salvation. And I mean everything. I mean forgiveness, repentance, the, uh, whether or not a, a piano is in the building and used during worship. Anything you, any good work you can think of, your salvation is hinged upon it. When that's your outlook, your church and yourself are going to feel that heavy burden, which is totally contrary to what Christ promises, which we will talk about. Travis, again, as I thought he would, accuses denominations of being founded by men. He rejects the idea of Alexander Campbell. Uh, we certainly will find that. We'll look into that a little bit more in the cross-examination period. As, as stated in my opening, the Church of Christ today, if you open an encyclopedia, a secular source or a Christian one, you will see that it goes back to Alexander Campbell, uh, Walter Scott, Barton Stone, and Thomas Campbell. These are men. These are men. But Travis is in the church that he is today because these four men organized it, established it, whatever language that you want to use, beginning around 1811 to 1827. Now, what do we mean when we say faith alone? Travis likes to say faith alone is not in the Bible, except for in the context of James 2, which I'm sure we'll get into later tonight. But when we mean faith alone, there is a, a clarifying context that we're using that term for in a, in a historical context. Uh, what, what we do when we say faith alone is what we mean is that we're saved apart from works. It's faith alone apart from works. That's truly what we mean by faith alone, or if you hear it, sola fide is just a, a hearkening back to the Reformation days. Romans 11.6 comes to mind where it says, But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. See, if you're in a church like Travis, you may not say it out loud, but you're going to church on Sundays, maybe Wednesday nights. You're worshiping in a particular way. You're taking communion in a particular way. You're giving offerings to the church. All of that is for your salvation. These are works. These are to, to, to merit your own salvation, totally opposite of the gospel of grace. See, when we are saved by grace through faith, I do all those same things that Travis do, but I do it in a reaction to my salvation and not by a means to earn it or to sustain it. Travis mentioned 2 Thessalonians 2.14 being called out by the gospel. You see, Travis has a unique definition of what the gospel even is, and, and I will ask him about that during the cross-examination period. You see, Travis's view of the gospel is so complex and so burdensome, it's not found in the gospel of John. You could not read the gospel of John, and maybe he shouldn't even consider God, uh, John a gospel 
because his particular plan of salvation is not found within its pages. Travis mentioned marriage uh, as a husband clings to his wife, uh, so, or uh, as the husband is the head of his wife, so is Christ the head of the church. Well, I'm going to talk about this oneness in marriage in biblical terms, especially at least in my closing statement. And we will talk about how the oneness of Christ, of the oneness of marriage, and the oneness of God in the Old Testament is, er, throughout the whole Bible, is reflected in the oneness of Christ's church through diversity. Like I said in my opening statement, the Baptist church is not the one true church. I really don't care when the Baptist church started. That is not when Christ church started. Christ church has existed actually before Pentecost, I would argue. Abraham belonged to Christ church. Moses belonged to Christ. All true believers who were saved by faith, even in the Old Testament, which is not really our, our topic of debate for tonight, are members of Christ's church. Travis mentions Romans 5, 9, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from, uh, from the wrath of God. We are not justified. There is not a need to come into contact with Christ's blood. If you ask Travis, which I may or may not later, where does the Bible say you need to contact Christ's blood? It is not a prescription that we need to follow. Instead, what Romans 5, 9 is talking about is that justification is possible because Christ knew no sin for for he, uh, for he made him sin who knew no sin, so that we may become the righteousness of God. That is the atoning work of Christ on the cross. Now, Travis uh, brought up the Mormons, and, and I think this just demonstrates why Travis is so confused about what a denomination is, what my position is. You know this is not Travis's first debate on this topic and with similar people as myself, and yet he hasn't understood what even we mean by the topic of denominations. He called the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses a denomination. Now, before I explain that, let me explain to you again why I associated Travis with that movement. You see, the Mormons claim, they, they call themselves the, a restorationist movement, the restored gospel. Travis claims, or his, his tradition, whether he acknowledges it or not, claims the same thing, that, that, Mark, that uh, Alexander Campbell, Thomas Campbell, those guys restored the gospel. No one else was believing this at the time. They got together and rediscovered the gospel of water baptism. And I've got quotes tonight to prove it. We can look at those if we need to. That's what I mean by a restorationist movement. The Mormons, Joseph Smith claimed that that was revealed to him that all the churches had fallen away and that he was given new revelation and a new mission to restore the church. That sounds eerily similar to what the claims of Alexander Campbell are. The Jehovah's Witnesses claim the same thing. They restore the true Israel. They restore Jehovah's Witnesses, Adventists through Ellen White. They all claim to restore and, and, and have a rediscovery of some kind of lost truth. There are countless movements in the 19th century which Travis Church started that we could examine and put into that category. Now, why do I reject, obviously, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses as a denomination? Number one, they believe entirely different gods, entirely different gods. They reject, reject the Trinity or the Godhead, whichever language you want to use there is fine, but they reject them outright. They believe that Jesus was the literal son of, the Mormons believe that Jesus was the literal son of God, the brother of Satan, okay? That is a fundamentally different God, not to mention that it is incredibly works-based, which I would say, again, actually aligns them, their plan of salvation, more in line with Travis than myself. Same for the Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? Different God. They deny that Jesus is God. He is a lesser God. He's Michael the archangel who came to earth as Jesus. See, these, these are why they're Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, we don't consider them to be denominations. They're fundamentally different faiths. And with that, I hand the time back over to Travis.
start my 10 minutes. All right, again, I appreciate you guys watching. Now, he brought up secular history. You know how much secular history really, uh, I mean, what is the point of secular history? Does that just make you feel better? Because, I mean, 1 Peter 4, 11, if anyone speak, let him speak from the oracles of God. I mean, what happened to just going back to the Bible and doing Bible things by Bible ways? Look at this, 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture. No, 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 no. All old books found by man in some library. No, I thought it was all scripture is, is given by the inspiration of God as proper for doctrine, for reproof, for, for instruction, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But now, he does want to play the, the old game that some of y'all call in and say, well, where, where is it before Alexander Campbell? Well, you know what? I took a little bit of time and did research. Now, this book here is called, is called Heresy Detected and Exposed. Okay, I have another book over here. I don't know if he has ever heard of it. It is called Traces of the Kingdom, and on the back it talks about throughout history there are groups of people who were baptizing for the remission of sins. But again, I got another book over here that even says baptism washes away sins. It's in Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Yeah, it's called the Bible. But they want secular history. You know why? Because he, he actually said the Baptist church is not the church of Christ. The Baptist church is not Christ's church. Then what is he doing in it? See, he actually just denied the whole Baptist church, which I agree. But see, he has to make the claim that I'm in a denomination because, see, he's in a denomination. It's kind of like one of those things where I hate to say it, but like uh, since he's not right with God and he can't find what he's doing in the Bible, he has to say you're doing the same thing. See, I wonder uh, if he would just drop all of these man-made titles and these creeds and just do what the Bible says. But I want to show you this real briefly because 10 minutes is going to fly by. This is a book, Heresy Detected and Exposed. Look, here is, he thinks, Apostle Peter. This is Alexander Campbell. And Mr. Campbell was nine years old in 1779. This is a quote from this book where his enemies, this is, this is the enemies writing about him, this particular guy, and he even writes out that he is the church of Christ. Look at the year, 1779. And you know what's unique? Is this guy is Mr. Foster. So I even asked Jeremiah North here. I said, man, if I could show you uh, a particular guy who was teaching that you're not born in sin, that we have free will, that he was against creeds, and he said uh, obedience was required Hebrews 5, 9, if he actually said those things like the Bible said, if, if you would just stop calling me a Campbell eye. He said, no, I probably wouldn't. So this is their mindset. See, proof doesn't matter from even this old book who his name was Mr. Foster, and I put his name up there because it's old English, and look, he even talks about how he was against creeds and these uh, uh, creed books and confessions of faith. And then it even lists what's unique about this. See, a lot of these old books, they don't break down what they actually believed. His enemy wrote what this guy was teaching, and he was teaching that children are not born in sin. They're not guilty of Adam's sin. Obedience is required for salvation, and that uh, we have free will. So these are the things that his enemy... Now, you can't always go off of everything that is written because you know what... I mean. He even, Tim even said, I said, there's thousands of things to do to be saved. See, you can't always go off what people say about you. Now, this is another book, writing about that book, and in 1942, they were told right here, the Church of Christ, before Alexander Campbell established a so-called uh, the denomination that he's promoting. But again, the Bible, again, isn't sufficient for him. It's very sad. And there's other books. You got here, Robert Simples talking about the history of the Baptist church. Look at there. The Church of Christ on Dan River. Look at the date right there. So, and then there's another picture floating around. But this picture really don't prove a whole lot because it doesn't even say what they believed in that way. You can even go with the early uh, church fathers. They were teaching in the second century. 
the church of God teaching that baptism was required for salvation. Right here is a quote. Repentance and remission of sins through water. All right? This is the early church fathers, what they were teaching. So, and, and there is actually a biblical example. I'm not going to have time to get into that about restoration, even in the Old Testament with Josiah. So, I don't think his arguments have... I, he was supposed to uh, affirm true Christians, and he said faith alone. True Christians are people who are saved by faith alone. Do, do you know faith alone? I can do a Bible search here and show you faith alone. Faith alone. It's not in there. You're not saved by it. Now, I will bring up here where the actually the Word of God. Now, he when he first started his second speech, he said we're saved by grace through faith. Well, I agree with that. But then he went on to how in the uh, Reformation movement, how it's, it's faith only. Who cares about what those guys were getting out of the Catholic Church? And they went to the extreme opposite. They didn't go back to the Bible and do what the Bible said. Look here. Now, you're going to believe the Bible. You're going to believe Travis. You're going to believe Tim. How about you just drop and don't believe Travis or Tim and just go and believe the Bible? You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Not by faith only. Now he brought up about these little groups within uh, the Lord's church who uh, don't have unity. Well, you know what? Is he right about that? Well, let me show you something interesting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, does that prove? Because there's some groups that like to drink out of one container. Maybe a more studying about a pitch pipe and understanding biblical authority. But look here, division in the church. Yeah, the church is a Christ. The, the divine sign is perfect. But the, but the church is made up of individuals. And see, we're not perfect individuals. And we have sometimes we have problems. But look here. The Lord's church had the same thing. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions. See, the Apostle Paul was against divisions. And this is not referring to Baptists or Methodists. This is referring to the Lord's church that I'm a member of. Sometimes he says, my church, it's not mine. Is he calling me Lord? I don't think he would recognize me as Jesus. But then he says in verse 11, For it hath been declared unto you, uh, unto me of you, my brethren, that by them of uh, which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now, now this I say that every one of you saith, I am a Paul, I am a Paulus, I am a Cephas, I am a Christ. Is Christ divided? No, Christ isn't divided. Was you crucified for Paul? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? See, the first century church even had. Division within it of itself, and the Apostle Paul is trying to straighten it up. You know, and that's where we all need to go back to the Bible and do what the Bible says. So that doesn't prove anything because the Lord's church has some division in it today. It did in the Bible. All right. Let me see what else he said. Uh, oh, Matthew 16, 18. This blew my mind. Matthew 16, 18, when he said this, maybe he misspoke. He said the church of Christ, the Lord's church, was in the Old Testament. Now you notice this. You'll have to just hang up on that. And it says, if you're, if you're calling in, we have a call-in part. Maybe you just seen the call-in here at the bottom. Let me move that real quick for you guys. All right? If you missed the first. So Matthew, we're going to have a call-in part at the end, okay? If you called in for the Bible program... That's good. If you called in for a telemarketer, never call me again. Matthew 16, 18. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter. Upon this rock I will build. I will build. When's he going to build it? He built it in, the, in Abraham's day? In Noah? Really? We just read in my first presentation about how there was a beginning at Jerusalem and Christ was going to establish his church. The terms were there in Acts chapter 2, friends. So I don't know what he's talking about, how Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were added to the Lord's church in the Old Testament when we see Jesus says, I will build my church. 
And he did that in Acts chapter 2 by the power of the Holy Spirit. All right. Thank you guys for watching that. Maybe there's a delay. We do have a someone that keeps calling. All right. So where are we at on our format, Tim? All right, if you want to come back up, I'm going to give you the mic right here. I'm going to set it over here. Was that just a number or was that a name by the name or was it a family name? No, I'm talking about the phone. Oh. Do we need to do two mics now? Yeah, I got mine right here. So now we're going to have a questions back and forth, an open discussion. 20 minutes, yeah, that's what yours. <clears throat> you want to set the time up and then move. No, there's no really way to keep up with one or two minutes on these questions. So we'll My questions are likely aren't going to take a minute to ask, so um, I'm okay with this being more conversational. All right. All right, Travis. Um, again, for those at home, thanks for hanging with us. I'm having a good time. I'm sure Travis is enjoying himself, and this is a great discussion. So, Travis, you said on your show this past Sunday night um, that Tim might show up and chop you up his hamburger meat. Are you relieved that hasn't happened yet, or at least not yet? Yeah. That's yeah. good. All right. All right. Okay. So uh, my first real question. So that book that you held up, Traces of the Kingdom, and you said that uh, it shows and demonstrates church that we're baptizing for the remission of sins. And of course, I would agree with that, that language. But so that, that demonstrates that doctrine through church history or just history? It is a guy that's in England, and he went through a library over there, and he has got a lot of clips through his research, talking about trying to trace individuals who were baptizing for the remission of sins mm -hmm. or uh, maybe having elders and, and biblical teachings with that. So is there anybody in there so far that you've read that you could confidently affirm as a Christian? Uh, not solely on just that. Okay. You know. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. But I couldn't affirm on either if they were a Baptist. Sure. All right. Um, can you define for us what a denomination is? A denomination, I had it pulled up. Uh, it is a autonomous branch. Depends on where you go to. See, viewers, you can't go to the Bible and find the definition of denominations because they didn't exist. They're foreign to the Bible. But you can go to Wikipedia or these dictionaries and Google it, and it says autom autonomous branch of the Christian church. Okay, so... Denominations are autonomous. You would agree. You agree with that defini definition? A branch to a off branch. the Christian church. Okay, but you wouldn't say that it's a branch. You wouldn't affirm that a branch. A branch would apply at same tree. Uh, well, they're a branch. They're they're claiming, okay, again that they're a branch. That there's one big group, kind of like what you're affirming, and the denominations are just broken off, and everybody's in the big church. Okay. The universal church. So, uh, again, on your show this past Sunday night, you defined denominations. You gave the example of Baptist churches here in Gainesboro, and then there's Baptist churches in Nashville. Same with Presbyterian. There's probably a Presbyterian church somewhere in Gainesboro. There's another Presbyterian church, uh, and those are kind of these organizations that are denominations. Right. right. Um, but then uh, you also mentioned... And you use the term salesperson, and I don't have your quote exactly on hand, but churches that call themselves community churches but are not part of any kind of organization. We just call, I'd call these non-denominational churches. Like I gave you a MacArthur Study Bible. He's, his church is Grace Community Church. He's not part of any kind of denominational affiliation. So, But you'd still consider that a denomination, right? Yeah, just because I say, I mean, the Mormon church, they say they're the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. Sure. Uh, just because you say you're, you're the Church of Christ or just because you say you're undenominational, because what it is is a lot of people, like even in my show, a lot of people look at 
some of the, the division, the denominations, this some baptize, some sprinkle, some have women pastors, some it's all it's all division, it's, it's all uh, unbiblical with their teachings. So what people do today is they try to say, well, we're undenominational, and that means basically we just accept everyone. But you're still teaching like if you're teaching faith only. I mean, I wouldn't consider you. A member of the Lord's Church, I'd consider you just a denomination under radar. So perhaps uh, we could better define denomination as just anybody that didn't agree with what you believe to be correct biblical doctrine. It would be anyone that doesn't uh, agree with the scriptures, not exactly what I I would agree, but the but you but you would say you would have to say you believe you're interpreting scripture correctly, right? Okay, so you're correct interpretation anyone that disagrees with your correct assessment of scripture well when it's a and when it's really straightforward contradiction I believe that the scriptures it's not like a, when, whenever you say in, interpret how you interpret you need to interpret make sure there's no contradictions within the scriptures sure sure yeah I would agree um, do you have perfect doctrine uh, I think the Bible has perfect doctrine and upon the Topics that are essential for salvation, yeah, we've got to get that right. So that would be perfect in that sense. Could you give me an example of a New Testament topic that may not be essential for salvation? That may not be essential? Like well, so what it was something a Christian is to do um, that would not be essential for salvation in your okay. mind? You mean pull it up for people? or? Yeah, you take a second pull it up. All right. Well, right here, one that believeth he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. So... Here we have a text where really the uh, what you eat, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. It's optional with that. Okay. And I'm, I'm doing my best to keep my statement, statements here phrased as questions because I'm supposed to be asking you questions. So would you say that's a command there? What's being commanded? Uh, well, as you read on later down and you go on, you see the command is you don't judge over matters of opinions. There's opinions like the one cup. If my brethren want to use one uh, container, mm -hmm. they have that. They can do that. Now, I could be wrong on that, but those that do, uh, don't they see that as a salvation issue? You must. I can't vouch for them. Okay. They'd okay. have to call in. So if they're right. one, con one container watching, they can call in and let you know. Okay. So uh, on your per on the kind of back in the, a couple steps up there on the perfect doctrine question. Uh, could you give me an example of anything that is commanded in that it would be considered disobedient for a Christian to do and it not be a salvation issue? And it not be? Yeah. Um, let me hear your question again. Is there any example, that, like you just pulled up, um, where a Christian could be disobedient? I'm trying to cl clarify here what I mean by a command. Is there anything that's commanded, which a command would mean if we didn't follow it, we'd be disobeying, that a Christian could do and it not be considered a salvation issue? Oh, if a, if a Christian, uh, well, like if a Christian fornicates, mm -hmm. okay, he would need to repent of that. So that is a command not to do that. Right. And if he does that, God has given us a way to get right back to God. Back with God. Yeah. But, it, but his salvation is depending on not fornicating, right? right. Well, and if he does, repenting from it. Yeah, First John 1, 7. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, what do you mean when you say things like, I, tra I and Travis don't have a church? I mean that the church uh, is established by Jesus Christ, and it is not mine in, as in possession, like Acts 20, 28. It was purchased with his blood. So he owns it. So I think he should get the glory, and then he runs his church, he, he has the authority through the New Testament. So it's not me to make up laws on the church keeping people out of heaven. He, he's the authority. So that's what I'm referring to. It's not mine. I don't have the authority. I didn't die for it. So you would avoid that language, it's that, uh, like my church. I try to as much as possible because we live in a society, oh, even Tim, even some Christians, they say, hey, won't you come to my church? Mm -hmm. And I've even teach my children, if if you if you talk th if you if your language continues to say things like that, it's going to actually build up where you're you could you could start thinking that it is your church. Like the, that means that you have all these different options. You know, you have your church, you have your church, you have your church. So how do I join <laughs> your church? 
Okay. The congregation that you assemble on the Lord's Day, how would I join that church? Okay, well, uh, you can't join the universal church, all right? The universal church, like the churches of Christ throughout the world, uni universal church, you can't join it. You have to obey the gospel. And then Acts 2.47, the Bible says, the Lord added to the church such as should be saved, or those who are being saved. So you actually have to apply, uh, comply with Jesus' terms. Like tonight, if you wanted to repent and confess that he is the Son of God and be immersed in water for the remission of your sins, you would be added to the Lord's church, the universal church, and now you would need to assemble with the saints. So, okay. so you said you can't join the Lord's church, but I could be added to the Lord's church if I followed what steps? Uh, well, we see kind of what I just said of believing the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see uh, the example set forth in the book of Acts. So the first gospel sermon, those people said, what do we do? Mm -hmm. And they were told to repent and be baptized in the name okay. of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So you, you, you uh, believe in the death burial, uh, death, burial, and resurrection. Okay. And you repent. That means you make a change of mind, yep. you change your life, you're going to serve the Lord, and you're going to be uh, immersed in water for the remission of your sins to contact the blood of Jesus. Okay, so how would you respond if I asserted to you that there are millions of Christians in these denominations that have done those five things? Well, I would uh, have to deny that they have done those things. Okay, so it's not. it's more than just be baptized and immersed for the remission of sins because we can we can and it's not really the topic of tonight talk about four and the meaning of ace and these right so you have to understand that not just be obedient and do it but you have to understand it in a particular way is that right well you have to understand uh why you're why you're getting baptized i mean we just can't grab a little kid and dunk them in water and say you're good to go i mean they're when we see the the examples uh, even in Acts 16, the Philippian jailer, when we see uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, when we see the people in Samaria, they were taught about Jesus and mm -hmm. they were taught about the kingdom. So th there is some teaching going on before someone. I would, I would agree. <laughs> That's why I'm a Baptist. We're originally called Baptists because their emphasis on believers' baptism. Uh, so sorry to my Presbyterian brothers out there that might be watching, but that is, that is my position on that. Um, why do you think Paul said churches, plural, in Romans 16, 16? Uh, well, because there was plurality, just like in the book of Revelation, there was uh, at least seven different congregations of the Lord's church. So when he says the churches of Christ salute you, they are different congregations, mm -hmm. churches, but one universal church, and they were all the church of Christ. You, you didn't have in the, the book of Revelation where the seven was... Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Jehovah's Witnesses. If there's only one church that has any significant meaning, do you think it would have been more appropriate for Paul to have written the Church of Christ salutes you? Uh, well, sometimes he did in other letters. Sure. Okay. Um, on that, so we're talking about the different congregations. Do you believe in uh, the idea of church membership, of local church membership? Yeah, I had earlier where, where there's many members but one body. And uh, we see in Hebrews 10, I think verse 25, where it talks about not forsaking the assembly. Sure. So they assembled with a local body, local congregation. Okay. Uh, do you recognize that it is important to be a member of a local congregation in that you recognize that there is a group, an, an assembly, let's just say 60 people, that have unique commitments, unique membership, and unique leadership amongst one another. Do I see what? Do you, do you recognize that that, there, yeah. that that is the case? But you wouldn't you wouldn't call that members of that church? Yeah, I mean, you oh, can you call would. Them, I'm a member of the. Well, you would say I'm a member of the Church of Christ, and I assemble at wherever the place is. You okay. know, uh, because when you become a member, you're a member of of the body of Christ. But then you, you, when you see the New Testament, they, uh, they, you have to worship. You ha I mean, you need elders. They had elders over them and, and things like that and encouragement and fellowship. Do 
Do you think Paul was wrong in Acts 21 to encourage the converted Jews to that it was okay to keep practicing the law of Moses? Uh, well, that view, do I think it was wrong? Yeah. <sighs> now, to give you some of the context I would consider here is that these were Jews coming together to worship yeah. and doing so in adherence with the law of Moses. They were Christ believers following the law of Moses. Well, this is about like when you're saying one of your uh, opinions, when you, you would ask about what is some opinions. Well, that particular scripture, you could say even the Apostle Peter, he sinned. So you could say that Paul had sinned when he did that. Would you say that? Would I say that? I haven't really studied that position uh, within that context right there so much to make a claim right now. But I don't think there's anything in there if you held that he did sin or that you could just continue to do uh, um, as far as, I forget what you, how, you, how you word it, but basically the customs of the law, certain customs and, and things of that nature uh, were in a process of being removed or, I mean, if you were raised a Jew, there might be certain things you may not continue to eat and that wouldn't be wrong uh, but it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't matter. Sure. So there might be some things within that. Would you agree that the worship service in that context in the church in Jerusalem probably looked very different than the worship service in the church that you're a part of? Well, in, in Acts 21, I don't. I don't. I don't believe that would have been uh, the Christians assembly. That was the Jews going to the synagogues at that time. That's converted believers. Converted believers. So so Christians. Which Acts 21 what? Um, I don't recall. You have to. You can pull it up. Okay, I don't remember what verse now. And this is just eat your time up, so we won't have to. Worry about yeah, that's that. fine. We we can talk. We can talk about that more another time. Um, all right, Travis, you're adamant that denominations are man-made and therefore should immediately be discounted as le- legitimate churches. What role do you say that Alexander Campbell played in regards to the Churches of Christ? From what little study I, I, I know about Alexander Campbell is he basically was saying, all right, let's go back to the Bible. It would be like this, mm-hmm. Tim. So when uh, the Apostle Paul went to Corinth, there was no Christians at Corinth until he got there and planted, planted the congregations by them obeying what Paul preached, right? Mm-hmm. So they didn't exist until he got there. So Alexander Campbell and some of the other ones, including the ones that I brought up before when Alexander Campbell was nine years old, they had a they had a calling about going back to the Bible. Let's go back to the Bible, lay aside our creeds and our prejudice uh, doctrine and just do what the Bible says. So that's what I think he had the mindset. And I think that the churches of Christ existed before him. And to be honest, I think this is what I think, that he came in contact with a member of the Church of Christ, and what made him so well known was he was a good debater. He got out and debated, and he was in the public eye, and so that's how he grew. And even he says he didn't start a denomination. He, he said, I do not want people to think that I started some denomination. So could you prove that, that there was any Church of Christ that, so adhered to the doctrine in your perspective that you would confidently say that they were a Christian at all? Oh, well, I, I showed The Heresy Detected was a book that I come across, and it actually shows some of the doctrine, and they were the churches of Christ, and they taught, they taught obedience. We're not born in sin. We're not totally depraved, free will, key doctrinal issues within the within the Bible. Is some of the doctrine enough to actually be a Christian in your view? If, oh, yeah. So I, mean, I, I obey yeah. some of the doctrine, okay? The I, things you, that's essential? I mean, there's some things that are essential, you know. Okay. Is is forgiving our enemies essential? Oh, yeah. Is um, doing good works and caring for the poor essential? Is worshiping without uh, a piano essential? Okay, so we could, so you would say that there's a lot of things that there are essential, right? Well, you're going to grow, too. I mean, you don't take a new baby in Christ and make and think he's going to know all of this. You're supposed to grow, and God looks at that and understanding you're a baby in Christ. So what you're looking at is you have to do all these things. Well, there's things that are connected with the blood, uh, like repentance, baptism, 
clearly connected with the blood. And then you look at after you become a Christian in John uh, 4, 24, we must worship in spirit and in truth. So you can't just worship God however you want. It's according to His Word with the right attitude. So worship involves remaining faithful. Yeah, yeah. we can definitely have a conversation about what kind of worship is ple pleasing to God um, for sure. So uh, kind of to wrap this up here, Travis, on your July 15th episode of Truth With Proof, you pulled my text messages up on your screen here, and you said that, and I quote, I think that I think that a man named Alexander Campbell wrote the Bible. You said that I said that, uh, they, that, that you said they actually think that Alexander Campbell took a time portal back on the day of Pentecost and preached the first gospel sermon. That's how deceived and ignorant these liars are. You're putting me in that category. Um, what have you felt that I've lied about tonight? Well, you have brought up again about Alexander Campbell. You have brought up uh, grace through faith alone. That's not biblical, so it's either true or false. Um, and many of you guys continue to get on uh, YouTube and say that I'm a Campbellite and Alexander Campbell started the Church of Christ. So my point was to show in the scriptures on that lesson, I showed everything that I believe and practice is within the Bible. So it's not Alexander Campbell, you know. So that's uh, my answer to, to that. And I mean, you said a lot tonight, so I can't go through it all. Anymore. All right, okay. Um, <laughs> all right, well, now it's your time to ask me questions. All right, let me reset this. Let me grab my Bible real quick because I need it. All right, so my question is, what is ignorant? What does that mean? Ignorant would be to lack knowledge. Okay. All right. So uh, my point is there's a lot of people ignorant out there. It's not a bad word for some people thinking that that's just so mean. Um, it, can a person openly be a pastor mm -hmm. and drink and promote on Facebook alcohol and... Uh, as such as getting drunk and be a faithful pastor? Uh, I would I say that getting drunk is certainly a sin and that a pastor should abstain from that. Okay. All right. What about another pastor who openly gets on... Uh, see, I had a debate. What it was, I had a debate with this guy named Adam, and uh, his pastor got on a platform afterwards and said, I wouldn't debate him when I sent a tent text message saying that we need to debate and not debate with Adam and then he gets on there and says that I wouldn't debate him. Is that a lie? Okay. Alright, so now you're asking me to comment on personal situations, which well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not going to do tonight. Okay, well, I mean, is it is it a sin to lie? <laughs> yes, lying is sinful. Can someone continue to sin and not repent and be right with God? I would say that a, uh, a true believer, a born-again believer will repent of sin. Yeah. Okay, alright. Alright. Oh, they're over here. I got it right now. All right, so my question is, in John 12, let me pull it up for the viewers. In John 12, you're promoting faith alone. Would you say that these Pharisees that believed on him, were they saved or were they lost? Pharisees that believed on Christ? Yeah. These Pharisees believed on Christ, and it says they would not confess him because they loved the praise of men. Were they saved or lost? I would say they're probably lost without being able to recall the further context in my mind. Okay, so friends, I want you to think about that. He says they're lost, but we see they believed, and he's promoting faith alone. And so tonight, if you convince me that true Christians are, are in denominations, um, and you convinced me that we're saved by grace through faith alone, could I have free will to choose to believe what you're promoting tonight, or is my, or is my salvation already predetermined? <laughs> well, Calvinism is not a topic of the debate tonight, but we can sure, surely talk about that. But you are free to do what your heart wants to do. Okay. All right. 
Um, let's see here. So you, you believe in like free will in that sense, but you would say that we're totally depraved and we can't. So Yeah, and, and just to clarify uh, your first question about the, the Pharisees, my position is that if you are a true believer, if you have saving faith, you will be obedient. You will do good works. You will confess. You will be baptized. You will repent of your sins. Some folks call that the lordship camp, and that's fine. Um, but just to clarify for you in the audience, that is uh, my belief. Okay, we see in Matthew 16, 18. Yep. Jesus says, I will build my church in our discussion. You you stated that the church of Christ, the Lord's church, mm-hmm. existed in the Old Testament when Jesus says right here he will build future tents. Yeah. Can you explain that? Sure. So when he says, I will build my church, this does not mean that his church did not exist yet by any means. Okay, Peter exists. He's building his church through Peter, through the apostles. He's building it up. This does not mean in any way that his church did not already exist or that it did not exist in some form because we have ecclesia, church, bride of Christ, comments about that from Christ before the day of Pentecost. So we know that the bride of Christ existed before Pentecost and that when he's talking to Peter here about building his church, this is a, a continuation on, a, a continuing on. Okay. When was it established? Was it established in Genesis chapter 3? It, was, yeah, it, would, have, it would have been established by Adam. Adam, so Adam was it okay. What I would call the, the, the covenant, Adam and Eve were under a covenant of works. When, when they broke that covenant, they became under the covenant of grace that covers the Old Testament and the New. All right, here we have in Luke 24, it says there was a beginning at Jerusalem. So there was a beginning for preaching the gospel in Jesus' name. Sure. How do, you, how do you connect that when there was a beginning in Jerusalem, okay, but you're saying there was a beginning actually in Genesis 3. Yeah. So there is a new covenant that is established in the New Testament. That's really what we mean by New Testament, Old Testament. I really don't like, I, I prefer to say Old Covenant, New Covenant. Okay, so there is a beginning, a new covenant. But even in Luke, Luke 24 here, you'd have to agree this is not the first time that repentance is preached. Okay, it was uh, Jonah preached it in Nineveh. God commanded him to go to Nineveh and preach to, for them to turn towards God. Okay, But Which, it says in his name. Yeah, they did preach repentance, but they didn't preach it in his name. Right, no one knew the name of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Okay. Um, how do you know you're saved, Tim? Uh, because of God's promises, because of my, my saving faith. Okay. Because I trust in, in him and him alone. If I were to ask you, uh, within the scriptures, how do you know you're saved? Could you give me book, chapter, and verse? Yeah, I would give you Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Uh, so it says, for by grace are you saved through faith? Through faith. Okay. And not in myself. All right. Well, it doesn't say faith alone, though, so it's by grace through faith? Or No, I've already explained to you what I mean by faith alone. Faith okay. alone, when we say that, I'm not quoting a verse there. What I'm saying is faith apart from works. And I gave you a reference from Romans 5 that says we are not saved by works. So when we say faith alone, I'm contrasting myself to someone like you or like the Catholics that would, okay. you know, they're very works-based. When we say faith alone, that's what I mean. It's a clarifying statement. Can you, can you go to the Bible and allow the Bible to determine what faith alone is? Can you give me a book, chapter, and verse where I can pull up faith alone and let, allow the Bible to say this is actually what faith alone is? When Paul writes in Romans that we are justified by faith, there is nothing else included there. Now, what you're going to try to do is change faith into faithfulness, which means obedience. Change. You're saying faith is a, is a working faith, and I would agree with you that faith is a working mm-hmm. faith, that faith produces good works. To, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 sets this up for us in verse 10. But we are saved by faith apart from works. There's, when it says we are saved by faith, it means we are saved by faith. As Hebrews, de- uh, as he- Hebrews defines it, it's hope for things unseen. Okay. That's what that's the biblical definition. If, of I, it. if I was to tell you, Tim, that I'm actually saved by grace through faith alone, but you have to be baptized for the remission of sins, how would you feel about that? Well, number one, I would say that I've been baptized for the remissions of sins according to Acts 2.38 as well. But I know what you mean, and you do, you're not saved by that. You're, there's five things you do before that, and then you must merit your salvation on before that. So I know you're saying it in a simplified way, but you don't really mean that you're saved okay. by baptism and the remission of sins. So, maybe, maybe you mean that salvation is just possible through that, but that doesn't justify you, right? But, but if I said I'm saved by grace through faith alone, mm-hmm. and I said you got to repent, confess, and be baptized, what, yeah, yeah, that would be. That a, would I would. I would say. I would say that is an incorrect statement. 
Okay. Now we're talking about we're getting we're talking about word definitions there because I've explained what I mean by faith alone. And you would mean something different, I guess, okay. in that context. Well, what I'm getting at is, is, like you just said, you said you you explain what faith alone, but you didn't allow the Bible where James explains what faith alone is. Yeah, but that's because I, I concede to you that the words faith alone are not together in the Bible. Therefore, I have to tell you why I'm using, just like I'll explain to you why I'm using the Trinity, okay? The Trinity is not a word that's found in the Bible, and yet it's a helpful term to help us understand the nature of who God is. So I explained to you what faith alone means in the same, in the same way I explained to you what the word trinity means. Okay. Uh, well, you said merit. Well, would it really be meriting uh, salvation if someone has to have faith in God? Uh, no. No? Okay. Would you? Number one, the Bible not, doesn't define faith as a work. So even what I would call my Arminian brothers and sisters would be the, those that lean to free will, not in your camp. Um, but they would say that faith is not a work, and I agree with their biblical de definition there, like what I already gave you from Hebrews. Okay. So is repentance, would that be meriting salvation? Repentance uh, is granted by God, as we see in Timothy. Uh, repentance is a natural uh, change that happens as a result of being born again. Um, so do you, do you believe that baptism is meriting salvation? Anything that you must do to make yourself savable or be saved, okay? Any, any outward action is going to be a work. That would be meriting your salvation. Okay. So by that, are you, are you telling the viewers that they actually are not having faith? It's not them that have faith? That some kind of, it's, it doesn't apply to them? Like, you don't have to believe? No, of course you have to believe. So you have to believe, but that's not meriting? That's not you doing something? You can't brag or boast about believing? <laughs> no, I would say regeneration, number one, precedes faith, but that's not really the definition tonight. But I believe, okay, that's not the same thing. That faith is, is a hope for things unseen. That is not an external work. Okay, in Luke 17, 10, mm -hmm. it says, So likewise, when you have done all these things which you have commanded you, you have to, it says, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty. So when Jesus is saying that, is he, is he telling you? Can you read that? Sorry, can you read that for me one more time? Yeah, it says, so like, let me bring it up for the viewers. Yeah, I'm not trying to burn your time, but I just want to answer carefully. So. It says, so likewise, when ye, when you have done all those things which are commanded, like the things that are commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty. So is this the mindset that you would merit those things that God commanded, or is this just saying, hey, I'm just, I'm just a servant doing what I'm told? I guess I'm not asserting or understanding what you're asserting that Luke 17 in here means. Well, it says those things which are commanded. Is baptism a command? It's a command. Okay. We are commanded to do a lot of things. Okay. So the things that we are commanded, can we not look at Christ and just say, I'm a servant, or do we have to look at Christ and say, I'm going to merit salvation? I guess I'm, I'm having kind of a hard time understanding the question. Well, I, would, I, would, I look to Christ out of my love for him, out of my gratitude for my salvation, that has, and, and therefore produce obedience. I'm obedient out of my love and gratitude towards Christ. Well, well my point is you said we... we that I merit salvation by doing something, but this is saying that you actually can do it and have the mindset that you're just doing it because you're a servant, not that you are owed something, like not that you have earned it. <laughs> I would say that is my mindset and not your mindset because in your camp, you're going to church, you're reading your Bible, you're praying, you're repenting, you're forgiving, you're loving your neighbor, you're doing all that stuff so that you will be saved one day. I'm already saved. I'm, I'm seated in the high place today, right now, justified, okay? And so therefore, I, do all, I, get, I get to do those good works, not because I'm trying to get anywhere or get anything out of it or I'm concerned with okay. my salvation. So, but these people were told to do something, all right? Mm -hmm. So do you think that these people had the mindset that they were just going to do it and also they had to obey it, but yet they were just servants? that they were going to have to obey what God said, yeah. what Jesus said. I would tell, I tell everyone, every, especially every Christian, you must do what God says. Okay, let's see here. In Luke 6, 46, it says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? And then he goes on to talk about, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you, show you to whom he is like. He is like a man who built his house and dig deep. 
and laid the foundation on the rock. So just for time's sake, he was a wise man, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, to be saved, do you, do you have to be a wise man or a foolish man? <laughs> to be, I, I'm not sure I'm going to answer with either one of those words. It's a simple thing to be saved. It's just faith, which is a hope for that unseen in Christ. Okay. You said it was just faith, but in John 12, 42, you denied them salvation. They believed. They had faith. All right. Okay. Faith doesn't just mean an empty belief. We would agree with that. Um, in James, even the demons believe. So there is a difference in a kind of belief. And it was a kind, and, and saving faith produces good works. In those one or two verses we looked there about the Pharisees, it says that they believed him, but there was not a, a, a product of good works okay. there. So that's why I was making that quick assessment and say, well, they may not have been saved. So you said saving faith produces good work. Yes. What if someone like a pastor doesn't repent or produce good works? Are they saved? So repentance is, I would say repentance is a lifestyle. And if they're continuing on in unrepentant sin, whether it be pornography was a big problem today, alcohol, you know, doing those things, I would say mm -hmm. there is cause for concern to say, hey, I don't, this person may not be uh, an actual believer. It, it's hard for us to put a, a time frame on to say, hey, they're addicted to alcohol for 13 months. and they So see. it involves them actually doing something. They have to stop doing something for their salvation. They will naturally desire to do so. They naturally desire? They'll naturally. De Repentance is a lifestyle. It doesn't mean I, I like that, that's, ca that's kind of Catholic. Like I do this, I owe repentance. I do something else, I owe repentance for that. Repentance is an ongoing turning away from my sin and turning towards so God. So if they naturally are going to repent, and if it's someone that doesn't naturally repent, were they ever saved to begin with? If, <laughs> repeat that question for me. Okay, you said it is naturally that they're going to repent. It's it's a natural thing that they're going to repent. Of, of a true belief, of someone who's, if someone has saving faith, yes. okay, Repentance will be a natural thing for them. But but I'm saying, if they don't, if they don't repent, mm -hmm. were they even naturally saved to begin with? Probably not. Probably not. I mean, I, I, I okay. can't I can't ultimately know. Uh, but it, as again, we we're, we're different here on this. You've got external works built up in your salvation plan. Um, I wouldn't ultimately. Know, I would be greatly concerned about the state of their salvation. All right, in Ephesians two. Eight. Mm -hmm. uh, was this letter written to individuals who were already Christians or not? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter? It doesn't matter because it lays out what salvation here is. You go to a church every Sunday and your pastor may preach Ephesians 2, 8, 9 to you, but you're still a Christian, right? It means the same thing, for by grace ye are saved through faith. Whether or not they were already Christians, we need the gospel over and over and over. It doesn't matter okay. if we're already Christians or not. So let me ask you this. Uh, so let's say that you are going to join a, a gym membership, right? Okay. Okay, you join the, the gym membership, right? Okay. And uh, you have to do certain things to join that membership. Well, well, what if that gym membership keeps mailing you stuff to join that membership and not mail you the benefits? Would you, would you be confused on why they keep asking you to join the membership when you're already a member? It, it, it's hard for me to follow that question a little bit, but it, it sounds to me like when we're talking about the institution of a gym membership, I would compare that to an institution of a local church. Could you clarify maybe that question again? Okay. Well, I mean, I'm trying to show you said it didn't matter if it was written to say people oh. or not. So. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. You're already a member, and they're still sending you the they're still sending you news to tell you the benefits about being a member? Well, it's like this. In Ephesians 1, 7 right here, um, let's, let's do actually. Because I'll tell you right now, man, we don't graduate from hearing the gospel. We need the gospel washed over us day in and day out, week in and week out. It's not something that Christians hear once, uh, you know, in my, in, and again, this is, obviously we disagree on Christians, but that I hear once, I'm good to go, I, I'm done with the gospel. I need the gospel, the same gospel, to hear it preached over and over again. Okay, Ephesians 1, 3, it says, Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Can a lost person read that and have spiritual blessings? I think a, a lost person can experience some spiritual blessings, sure. Okay, is one of those blessings a lost person, will they have remission of sins? No, a lost person is, does not have their sins forgiven. Okay, okay. Can you tell me the account where the Ephesians uh, in the book of Acts were converted? Uh You'll have to rem you'll have to remind me. Okay, Acts or a after Peter's sermon in Acts two. Acts Acts nineteen or Acts nineteen. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, let's see here. Can you explain for the viewers Acts 22, verse 16? Where it says, Now, why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Because it looks like it's saying, Be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Yeah, just like what Peter says, or what they ask Peter when, he, uh, when they say, What shall we do? And he says, Repent and be baptized. Okay, for the remission of sins. And I'm talking about for here, just like John the Baptist was beheaded for his faithfulness. This is not a literal washing away of your sins. Okay. So it's got to be some kind of figurative speech. All right. This says the churches of Christ. Mm -hmm. Tim, can you find the Baptist church in the Bible or the Baptist churches? Uh, I can't find any name prescribed in the Bible. Okay. Where does faith come from? Faith comes from the heart. Is that what you're asking? It, it, it's my, yeah, it's, my, it's an inward, like I've defined over and over tonight, a hope. So wherever that hope comes from. If I, if I ask you, uh, where in the Bible can you get book, chapter, and verse where faith comes from in the Bible? Where faith comes from? Yeah, from the scriptures. Can you tell me where faith comes from? No, you have to remind okay. me, Travis. Uh, Romans ten seventeen. My point is, so faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. All yeah. right. So, uh, and you're you're saying that we're saved by faith, but you can't read about some of the things that you're promoting from the Word of God. Well, obviously I disagree with your statement there. I fully agree with Romans 10, 17, that there is power in the Word of God. And whenever I preach, whenever I evangelize, I'm using Scripture as that because God says that His Word will not return to Him void. So I am dependent, not on my own wiseness or anything like that, but on the words of the Lord to save people. All right. Well, we'll just end it right there with three seconds. I had some different questions, but I wanted to kind of just go on topic then. All right, guys, thanks for joining in again. I hope you've stayed with us. We're going to take a, about a two-minute break. If that, i got to get something to drink. And we'll be right back, and we will answer phone calls from you guys. And I'm going to put the – when I get back, I'll put the number up because you guys will be calling while I'm trying to get something to drink. And they'll be – how long was the time for the callers? Uh, we said uh, 30 minutes maybe. Yeah, I can't remember. I don't, I'm not sure we put a time on it. We can just play it for 30 minutes. Well, once we get the topic in 30 minutes, go about that. Yeah, and I'm not going to. I'll just have to hold the phone up. All right, if you guys are watching and you want to call in and discuss, you can ask us a question. You can uh, refute maybe through the subject tonight what we've discussed. I think we had about at least 30 people, at least on average, in the audience. I think we had some good back and forth. And until then, I guess we can continue to have dialogue with one another, me, me and you, as far as that goes, if no one's going to call in. There is a delay, yo, so they're probably just now hearing about calling in. So we want you to call in and ask uh, either one of us. You want to ask Tim a question? He drove. He drove an hour and a half, roughly. So if you guys want to ask him any questions, go ahead, or myself. I'm sure you maybe shared this with some people that have the same mindset as you. And we are doing better on uh, time than I thought we were going to do. Yeah, there is a couple individuals who... Uh, who has tried to call, but they're blocked and uh, for that reason. But um, for our own reasons, I mean, if they're not going to openly repent after we talked about, they were probably never saved to begin with. But, well, you, you want to ask me a question? We can have back and forth until someone calls in. Is that a call? All right, caller, thanks for watching. Appreciate you calling in. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. This is Clint Little, Travis. How are you doing? Good. I've got another call. I'm going to switch over. I'll come right back to you, Lowe. Okay, great. 
there's someone in front of you, so uh, I'll come back to you, okay? Okay. I could merge them. Boy, that'd be confusing, wouldn't it? <laughs> All right. Hey, Clint, are you there? I'm here. All right. What would you like to ask one of us, or what's your comment? Uh, your friend uh, is Tim, correct? Yep, that's me. Hello, Mr. Tim. Hey, Clint. I'm, uh, Clint Little in Atlanta, Georgia. How you doing, man? Thanks for calling. Been, listen, been listening to drives for a while. Um, so here's a question. You can, it's I guess it's kind of for Tim, but you can both answer. Uh, Jesus said in what's considered part, you know, one of the great commissions, uh, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. I know the rest of the verse. He doesn't believe will uh, be condemned. But anyway, so he said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And then we see nine explicit examples in Acts of people being saved, uh, Acts 2.38, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Paul, uh, Acts 22.16, you know, you probably know all of them as well as I do, um, and in every one of those examples, bab belief and baptism are in water for remission of sins. They don't, you know, they don't need to say that specifically, but I believe that's what is shown throughout those examples, if you if you kind of put every all of them in context, um, so my question is, if Jesus said to put to believe and be baptized, mm -hmm. and all of the examples show that we are to believe and be baptized, then why today would not someone who wants to become a Christian believe and be baptized to be saved? Okay. Yeah, I would say. <laughs> You're, I agree with you, Clint, that Jesus commands baptism. So we ought to be baptized. And if you, uh, like in uh, Mark 16, 16 here, and there's two ways I would really answer that. I'll lean on one of them in particular tonight. Uh, that he who believes and be baptized, no one, this is demonstrating an outward work. I said that people who are truly saved do have good works. It's not the good works that save them, but it's, a, it's a, uh, uh, an outward demonstration of the salvation that has that has occurred. So the distinguishing here is he that believes, again, it's not just an empty belief. There is works that follow, just like Ephesians 2.10 connects with uh, our, that salvation experience. Um, so I, I do believe everybody should be baptized in the, uh, for the remission of sins in Acts 2.38. But our hang up there, of course, is how we are going to define the word for and or ice, ace in the Greek. Okay. Clint, do you have uh, anything else you want to respond back? We're having a little bit of open dialogue, so uh, you can respond I'll, back. I'll, I'll say uh, one more thing. I don't want to hog the phone. There, I know there's another caller waiting. Um, oh, that's good. So, so when he said believe and is baptized shall be saved, um, and then in Acts 2.38 where Peter re Repeated that and many others he said said mm -hmm. many things. It, yeah. it, it says that he he can, he preached many things to many things to them that we didn't we haven't been able to read. Uh, but the essentials are there. What we really need to know that but that's how I believe the essentials are there. And so he said for baptism for the remission of sins. And you mentioned that word for. Well, there is. That word for is 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 the idea of unto or so that uh, a person will have remission of sins, and you must have the uh, at the differing view of that word for. What do you think but, it is, Tim? I do think that is important, Clint. And again, I appreciate the question. Um, the three times in Acts, the word ace is translated not in order to receive, but in reference to or looking to. Uh, just like I mentioned before, John was beheaded. We could use for and say John was beheaded for his faithfulness. That doesn't mean that, that John was beheaded in order to obtain his faithfulness. And then in Matthew 3.11, it says, I indeed baptize you with water unto ace. Again, that same word that we translate uh, for for next to, uh, unto repentance. Now, you wouldn't say that John's baptism was gaining anyone repentance, right? So, I think there's a good case to, to say that for in Acts 2.38, or an ace in general, is most oftenly not translated as uh, in order to receive or 
in order to get? Well, uh, John's baptism is said to be for uh, repentance and for remission of sins. So, okay. Clint, do you think that, that the people became repentant by John's baptism, so they were baptized and then they became repentant because of the baptism? No, I, no, I think they became repentant and and did what John commanded them yeah. to do. The repentance yeah, I agree. is part of the baptism. But but yes, they were... They're, they're all part. It's all one and the same action, really. All right. Hey, thanks for calling and watching, Clint. I looked at the time and we got... 22, so I'm going to Thanks, Clint. I'm going to elaborate a little bit and then switch it over. Okay, great. Have All a good right, night. Thank you, Tim. We do still have our uh, closing statements to do, so don't anybody leave yet. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, I, you know what? We were supposed to do that before questions, but we, we'll just do that at the end. All right, hang on. There's uh, someone in front of you, okay? Okay. All right, so I want to elaborate a little bit on that. In Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's pretty simple, and that is connected with Acts chapter 2 for the remission of sins. Uh, there's no no one in the King James translated that word ace or ice because of, and that's kind of what you're saying. It's be, You repent and be baptized because you're already saved, right? But if I believe and am baptized, and like there's millions of Christians that do that in, in the denominational world, in your opinion, is that all they have to do if someone who's just believes and is just baptized will be and they'll be saved? Is that what you're telling me? No, I mean I went through that. This is one of the the simplest ones that you do have to do to be saved. But but the way you're interpreting it, that's kind of an incomplete statement, right? Because no, believeth. So believeth means obey everything God tells you to do. Yeah, believeth. So it sounds to me that you're okay. Okay, we're supposed to look at the caller questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> go ahead, caller. Hey, um, I have two questions, if I'm allowed to, to ask two, and they're for Travis. Well, uh, are, you going to, are you going to openly repent? This is Jeremiah uh, North here, uh, and you're, you're the one that was on Desmond. You were on Desmond's YouTube, and you said that I wouldn't debate you, and you laughed about it when I sent you a text two days before. So, I mean... And Tim already said that if you don't repent, you will probably never say. Well, just let him ask the question, man. All right. Well, we're not taking Jeremiah nor Tears call or Trey. Well, you didn't give me a list of people I could prohibit from calling. Well, I'm sorry. They can call you on your show. <laughs> you got so, All right, go ahead. If Travis lets you through. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just got a comment to make about the Greek and uh, a couple of questions for each of you, if that's okay, or a question for each of you, if that's okay. All right. Thanks for watching. Go ahead. Um, well, the Greek, uh, you guys, uh, you know, are relying on the Greek and trying to, well, trying to make them as a, a hard law. In other words, this is what it means, but you can't really do that with the Greek. You have to put it in the context of what it's saying, right? Okay. Who would agree, uh, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, so my question for Tim is, what doctrine... Uh, that the Church of Christ follows today that originated with Campbell. And my question for Travis is, could you elaborate on 1 Peter 3, verse 21? I didn't tell me. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. <laughs> All right, so you got a question for me and a tee up for Travis. Okay. All right, so Alexander Campbell, uh, baptizing to literally, literally remit sin, they, they called it the gospel in water, was not practiced before them at least that's what they thought now when you have the the catholic church and they baptize to to wash away original sin travis denies that but it, it's a totally different thing so campbell believed that they were baptizing to literally remit sins now even if you can find somewhere else in the world that was also doing that that's not enough to be the one true church as travis would say it i think it's 21 all right, so caller asked about elaborating a little bit on this. Well, he he uh, was asked, what did Alexander Campbell teach, basically, that, that the Bible didn't teach, and or what did Alexander Campbell bring up new that the Bible didn't teach, the Church of Christ teach? That was not his question. What was his question? That was not, what did Alexander Word. teach that was not being done elsewhere? Okay. If I understand, you can clarify, but it wasn't. What did Alexander, Alexander teach that was not taught, I think he said in the Bible, right? No. 
I mean, if he did, I would I miss I misheard okay. him. Well, you answered it. I'll let I'll let him take that. First Peter three twenty one. It says, "The light through the word to even baptism doth now save us." Now again, you can't find faith only, and it, well, you can. It's in the negative. He's promoting it. And it says, baptism also now saves us. Again, the inspired word of God says baptism saves us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh. It's not just what some people say about getting clean. It saves. It's not a ritual. But the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection, friends, the gospel. When, when you obey the death, burial, and resurrection and watery baptism, God cuts away your sins, Colossians 2.12, and baptism saves. Go ahead, caller. Yeah, my question is on John 3.16 and also John 3.18. The phrase, believe in him. What does that phrase believe by very definition, looking at the word of God as being the Bible dictionary itself? So going into the scripture, so what does the phrase, believe in him, actually mean? And I'll just hang up and listen. Thank you. Hey, what was the other verse? Uh, 318. Okay. I want a definition of, of believes in him. Okay. What does that mean? All right. Thanks for watching. All right. Hang on just a second. Do you want, you want me to answer this one first? Yeah, you go ahead. And then you answer it? Sure. Well, John 316, that's the verse that everybody knows. But the context, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. This is actually before... Um, uh, things were preached in Jesus' name in Acts chapter 2. But the believes is the present tense. If you look at the King James, it's believeth. It's a continuing thing. And um, believeth in him should not perish. So it's a continuing believeth. It's not a just a mental ascent because we actually can see, and I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit on John 3, 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Well, we know this is not just faith only because in John 12, 42, Tim admitted that those people were lost. And if you look at the Bible and keep reading, it shows that believeth Tim is who, whosoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. So believeth, biblical saving faith is right here. John 3, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with the word obey. We are commanded to believe. That, that is an act of obedience. Now, it's not a, a work. But to believe, to trust, means to, to trust right, like trust Christ, like I mentioned before, he that was made sin, who knew no sin, uh, so that we may become the righteousness of God, trusting in that. Because, again, I agree, there is a belief, there is an empty belief. Even the demons believed and tremble. So there's okay. a difference there. I believe that those who have saving faith are obedient and obey God. All right. Caller, Just, thanks for watching. I agree with that. that this, this, is, uh, this is a new caller. Okay, yeah. Thanks for watching. Go ahead with your question. Hey, this is uh, Brother Crawford. Uh, uh, how you doing? I'm doing good. And yourself? Good. Good, good. Yeah, I'm definitely enjoying the debate. Uh, I just wanted to point out in James chapter 2, I know you quoted it earlier, you misquoted it, you ripped the verse out of its context, James 2, 24. Uh, the Mormons also use the same arguments to prove justification is by faith and worth, uh, just like the Church of Christ. So I want to just address this in context. Starting at verse 18, it, was, it says, but someone would say, you, will ha you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. And this comports with Ephesians 2, 8, and 10, which, which Tim well, pointed out. Okay. Well, can I ask you a question? Uh, yes. Yeah. So your context, you would, your context would start at verse 18. I would no, encourage... no, no, no. I just pointed that out because that's usually the, uh, the verses that people quote, just like you did. You started at verse 24. You didn't give the context. Okay. So, well, what would you say about verse 14? Where's verse 14? Oh, let's see. Uh, what does it? Oh yeah. What does it profit, my brother, if someone says they have faith but does not have works? That's the exact same thing I see. Well, you didn't said. quote it all. You you stopped there. No, you quoted 24. You you quoted verse 24. Why can't I start at 18? No, I'm saying when you quoted verse 14, you didn't read the end of it. No, I wasn't even finished explaining what I was gonna say. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Okay, yeah. So, well, I'm just saying in context, James 2 is not talking about um, salvation um, before God, like justification before God, but rather vindication before God. But I want to jump to 24 because that's the quote you quoted. Okay. You, you said, you see, then a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Mm -hmm. But if you scroll up, uh, to verse, uh, where is it? To verse 21, it says, Well, Abraham, our father, not justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar. And then, you, and then it says, yeah. Do you see that faith was working together in which exactly what we'll believe, which is the faith only doctrine that produces works? When, and it says, When, when did that take place in the book of Genesis? That took place in Genesis 22. Who was around when that happened? Do you remember? What do you mean? Who was around? When he offered up his son Isaac. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, well you're. you Are you saying that we're justified? Uh, do you believe that this is talking about justified before men? Uh, I think that has a lot Correct. to do with the larger context. Well, I wasn't. Of James, I wasn't. James, I was and to, to answer that question, his servants were around. They went up on the mountain. Oh, when his servants were there when he offered up his son. <laughs> No, they went up with the servants, and then uh, they, he and his back. son went the rest of the way up to. Yeah. Okay, so the servants didn't actually see this right here. What's your point? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting point you're making. Can you elaborate on that? Well, you're, you're trying to say that uh, Abraham was going to offer his son up on the altar uh -huh. to be justified before his servants when his servants. Well, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. No, that's not what I'm saying. Oh, you're saying it's, it's to be justified before men. No, no, no. Men. That is the that is the overall context that James that's the is addressing. That's why, yeah, that's oh. why I was trying not, to not, not that Abraham was justifying anything before his servants. So you do but, your works but, to be justified before men. Well, that, well let, let me explain it, Travis. <laughs> no, explain. That, but that's what James is addressing. Somebody walks in. When you read, I think you should start with the context of James 2, verse 1. He's talking about somebody walking into your church, and how do you know yeah. this person is a believer? That's why James says, you show me your works, I'll show you mine. I can't, somebody Correct. says they believe, okay, but I, I need to see their so, faith working. So, Mr. Crawford, do you, do Wait, you? Hold on, let me, oh, let me, let me, ahead. let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, an important statement, though. This is what I really wanted to get to. Abraham was justified long before he took altar, I mean, um, Isaac up to the altar. And that's found in Genesis 15, 6 which is quoted in Romans chapter 4. It says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Mm -hmm. So Abraham was just, and that's talking about justification, which is the exact argument Paul is making in Romans 4. And then he seen his faith well, in well, action. Well, before you leave, let me ask you a question with that. Uh, was in Genesis 15, 6, that's what you're using, right? Abraham was justified there? Well, yeah, Romans 4. Okay. Uh, also was he justified before that or not? Uh, say it one more time. Was he justified before Genesis fifteen six or not? You said he was justified there, and I agree. But was That's he also Christ justified Christ. before that? No, no, I don't believe so. Oh. I believe he was justified. You have faith about being justified. I, I believe he was justified when scripture said he was justified. Genesis fifteen six. Genesis twenty okay. two comes later. Okay. All right. You know where no, I'm going with that, context, don't you? James he was justified. I, mean, I didn't have time to go throughout the whole entire verse. I mean, verses. That's why I wanted to kind of pamphlet. Right. Some of I understand. And I, my point was, it seems like you don't actually really know Hebrews 11 was stated before Genesis 15, 6, because you actually said that Abraham, you said it by implication, you said Abraham here in Hebrews 11, 8, by faith Abraham obeyed and he wasn't even justified. And you believe we're saved by faith alone well, and you deny again, that. You, say, you want to say we go off of scripture, show me where it says he was, uh, it was accounted to him as righteousness. That's Genesis 15, 6. I'm just giving you scripture. Okay. And well, I expect it like you're doing. Okay, so you can have faith even though it doesn't directly say it. You know, there's a lot of things implied, all right? Implication well, we by faith. Go by scripture. We can go on by only what scripture says. In Genesis 15, okay. 6, as it was accounted to him as righteousness. And so he if believed, you want to say you go off the Bible, you should do the same too, because you okay. spent the entire argument making that point. So Okay. This guy's a member of the Baptist church and he wants to only use scripture and he's part of a church that's not in the Bible. That's a that's 
a strong man argument. Okay, it's a strong man. All questions. right. Do you do you want to? All right, bye. All right, thanks. I was gonna say if you wanted to uh, reply to his comments, but it really geared toward me. All right, caller, you're on Truth and Proof. Thanks for watching the debate. Okay. Thanks for holding. I know it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> I got a question for both of you. You can answer at the same time. Same time? It would be Pentecostals then. No, I'm just joking. Let me switch back over. I had another call. All right. Go ahead, sir. I had to switch over. I had another call. So if you ask the question, we didn't okay. hear you. Go ahead. Do you believe God can speak to a child? That, do I believe God can what? Can God speak to a child? Okay. Are, are, you, are you talking about like a, a like a little child? Like a uh, say uh, or a child of God? Child. I would say, yeah, God could speak to whoever He wants to. Well, my answer would be Hebrews eleven one. I mean, uh, yeah, Hebrews eleven, 11 Hebrews one verse two. We've been going on a while. It says, "But in these last days, He's spoken to us by His Son, to us by His Son." And how does He speak? How does God speak to us today through the Bible? So I don't believe. Today, well, that God speaks to people like audible voices. Well, I would agree with that, um, but we're not talking about cessationism tonight. Uh, but God. That's what he asked, though. But he said, could God? Of course God could, but okay. I agree with you. He's given us his word. I don't word. think God can today. You think, you think God is literally not capable of speaking to a child? Well, I think he has the power, but he's also, uh, he would contradict his own self if he did that. Uh, okay. Well, okay. He has the capability, but I agree that he's given situation. he's given us his word, and this is how he speaks to us today. I agree with yeah. that. Well, God cannot lie, right? That's right. You don't believe God can lie? Do you not believe he's powerful? <laughs> no. That's that's it. What, is it is not it, going with it? Right. It is. If he has the capability. Okay, can I finish? To, yeah. Go ahead, sir. Okay. My dad, <laughs> born in 1927. I didn't hang up on him. Are you still there? Call back if you're watching this. All we heard was what? His dad, 1927. And I didn't hang up. It just clicked, so I don't know. I hate that. I was going to see what he had to say. Oh, what is that? It connected to some Bluetooth. I don't even know what. Uh, are you? Did you call back? Okay. I'm his sorry. Mother, I don't know what happened. His mother was giving him a bath in the wash house. Uh, the Pentecostals had were the ones that had the brush order. and while they were all the night before. When he was doing that, jumping around in the wash house, just got out of the wash tub, uh, a fruit jar fell off, a shelf broke, and he stepped on it and laid his foot open. And he's told me many times that God told him, you will not make fun of my people. So... When he got old enough, he started going to the Pentecostal church, the church of God. And I believe that God can speak to anybody. And that always told me that there are true Christians in every church. Even though you can't read about them in the Bible? Well, you talk about a bunch of stuff that you can't find in the Bible. What's that? What's one thing I talk about? I, I, haven't, ta I haven't written it down. Uh, well, you, you, you called in to make a claim that I'm talking about a bunch of stuff that ain't in the Bible. In my program, I bring up the Bible up here. So, Yeah, Travis just begs the question. He begs the question by making statements like that. Hang on, Nick, okay? Yes, sir. I'm going to get back to this caller. Hey, sir? Yes. Can you... Are you watching this... Can I just say... 
I said, uh, sir, are you watching this where you can see the screen? Hi, I am. Okay, can you read this verse for Tim and myself? Tim. I, I saw that you pick up, pick out the little bits that you only want to see, be seen, and you skip the others. I see that all the time on your show. So you don't believe this scripture right here in John twelve forty eight? Uh, my words has the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will, I can't see for Tim's shoulder. Nope. It says, uh, oh, he moved. It says, I have spoken with we'll judge. judge him. Oh, sorry. Yes, God will judge us on the last day. And I am so glad that we're not before a jury trial. But you're going to be judged, right? Judgment. You're going to be judged? Oh, we all will. What are you going to be judged by? Oh, your feelings or a story? We're going to be what? judged by God. But what about God? I mean, how's he going to do his judging? What's that say? Judged by what? The word? You know, it's, yes, it's, it's really the not, there's not by much. the word. There's, He's not going to take bits and pieces. Oh, okay. He's not going to take bits and pieces. It's, like it's kind of silly do. for Travis He's I to argue with this. The whole word. Because I believe, and Travis is asserting that, that probably I don't by this passage as well, that the Bible is our sole rule of faith. Travis talks about creeds and all that stuff. All that, it's just helpful tools. The Bible is our sole authority, even though Travis doesn't represent it like that, uh, my, my position like that on his show. Okay. Well, my point I is, you so hardly, Tim. Be praying for you, Travis. Okay, well, won't you uh, call in and we'll talk more. I probably got time for one more. All right. Yeah, Nick, you got about a minute. Oh, <laughs> I'll make it quick. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, you guys, for putting this on tonight. Tim, thank you for joining in with this program with Travis. Um, great discussion thanks Nick. uh first of all i'd like to say this um there was a lot of things that i agreed with you in reg i had another call i don't know if you want to take it or not but those were people from a multiplicity of faiths and then you also i've heard you hey can you mention, can you start i'm sorry we kind of got interrupted can you repeat your question again yeah, my question is this if you if, if if you believe in a multiplicity of faiths how would you deal with Ephesians chapter 4 or 5. I, saw, I heard you quote that earlier um, where you said there's one Lord and there, but there, in one baptism and one body was the topic. But if we'd have kept reading, it would also have said one faith. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word. Why do you contend with a multiplicity of faiths? That's my first question. The second one would be this. I heard, also heard you mention earlier that you were baptized for the remission of your sins. And so with you saying that, do you confirm or deny that baptism is essential unto salvation? Okay. Okay, so the first one, uh, there is one faith. Myself, like an example I gave out in the beginning, the Presbyterians I evangelize with, the guys from the non-denominational church that, we, that I go out with, our faith is in the same thing. We have the same faith, and that is through Christ's righteousness that is imputed to us through his work on the cross. That's that's our unity. That's the one faith. The second part, I am baptized in accordance with Acts 2.38. The difference here is we disagree on the definition of for. Travis says it means for in, in order to obtain. I say that the biblical evidence is that ace most often means in reference to or concerning. So that Acts 2.38, being baptized for the repentance of this uh, or remission of your sins, that remission has already occurred at the point of faith, and now we're baptizing to be obedient. Okay, because I'd like to make a comment on that as well. You'll never find a Greek scholar that will ever define ace or ice, however it's pronounced, as because. Because that word for that you're referencing, sir, is also in Matthew 26, 28, where Jesus held up the cup, blessed it, gave thanks, and said, this is the cup of the new covenant, which was shed for many, for the remission of sins. And it's the same exact word. And if you want to keep that approach to that word for, then that's also to suggest that your sins were forgiven, sir, before Jesus' blood well, was shed. It, it's not just the English word for, it's the Greek word ace that's used in that. And there are countless, I mean, we could go to Greek scholars if we had a night to do that, sure. examples of where ace, the word that's translated as for, 
means concerning or with reference to. Well, and you know what? Here's one right here because in Galatians 3, 26, we are all children of God by faith for as many of us who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That word for there is gar or as a result of. But that word that you're referencing in Acts 2.38 is never defined of as because. Okay. Okay. Anyway, thank you guys for your time. Thanks for calling. Thanks for watching. We do have one more. I don't know if you want to take it before we do it. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. One more. Go ahead. All right. So, You're our last call. So, um, hey, Travis. My name's Chad. We spoke before. Um, I'm a Christian. Um, so I had a question for Tim, uh, and I'd like, if it's okay, if you could put Acts chapter 16, verse 30 through 34 on the screen. But, uh, Tim, at what point were you saved? At, when I came to saving faith, when I trusted Christ for my salvation. Hang on. Hey. All right. Go ahead, Chad. You said Acts 1630? Acts 16, 30 through 34. So I asked Tim, at what point was he saved? He said, trusting faith. Okay, Tim, now with that trusting f uh, faith, did you pray? It, I pro Yeah, I, I did back when I was 26. It's not the prayer that saves me, though. You're not going to find me as a proponent of the sinner's prayer. That's for sure. No, but, but you did faith plus prayer, right? So it wasn't faith only. No, 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 no. It, it's not what I said in a prayer. It was faith is, is a condition of my heart. It's a hope. It's a trust. I don't have to say it out loud or say it in a prayer in order for that, for me to have that faith. I don't okay, get I don't get the faith prayed, because I said a prayer. But if you wouldn't have prayed to the Lord and asked, said, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner, would he have sinned? Would he have forgiven your sins? I, I'm I'm not I'm not really saying this question makes a lot of sense because but because I came to faith, I produce that prayer. It's not the prayer is there isn't a isn't a magic link that now the Lord will forgive me. Okay. I was I was well, in a forgiven condition and then I prayed. Well, yeah. God bless you, sir. But I, I think you're not being fair because you you definitely pray. Uh, you definitely believe. Plus, you prayed. Because if you wouldn't have uh, prayed based off that condition of prayer, Christ would not have saved you. And I'm sure you would agree with that with uh, faith. But anyway, Chad, Chad, and, and Acts, real chapter, quick, real real quick. Oh, you had something else. Okay, go ahead, real quick. Yeah. In Acts chapter 30. Uh, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 16, verse 30, um, it says, "Sir, uh, the, the jailer asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Right? So uh, Paul said, uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, right? So in this, in this pericope from verse 30 to 34, um, when does it say that the jailer believed? Verse 34. It said he believed God, but, but he believed God after he did what God had asked him, uh, or after uh, he was baptized. So if you look at verse 32, it, well, he, in, no. in 30. No, it says believing in God. It doesn't say that he started to believe God. Yeah, but, but he, hadn't even, he hasn't even heard who Jesus was. How could he have believed in God? Oh, no, Tim's referring to verse 34. It says, and rejoice believing in God. He's trying to say that made a difference between Verse 31, believe and believing, even though what he did in between those. Okay, so verse 30 asks, what must I do? Verse 31 through 30, uh, 33, Paul's explaining what he must do. In verse 32, you says he, spe he spoke the word of the Lord to him. So in that, if we go to verse uh, 33, baptism was included in, that, uh, in speaking the word of the Lord. And you have what Travis said earlier, Romans 10, 17, Faith comes by hearing. Now you have verse uh, 33, right? So let's go to verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. So that jailer who his government, his government beat those men, Paul and Silas, he beat them. Okay, this man repented. So if you understand a, a phrase called synecdoche, which means a part standing for the whole, you'll see that the belief you know that. in verse 34 mm -hmm encompassed everything that God, uh, that when the word of the Lord was spoke to him. So you see, he took them that same hour of the night, washed their stripes. So you got repentance and faith. Right. So the man, if you, if based off your theology, he should have already believed, but he doesn't hear. No, he doesn't. Then you see verse, uh, the rest of verse 33, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Okay. So right there you have the word of the Lord being spo uh, spoken. <clears throat> it includes repentance. It includes uh, belief, faith, and then you have a baptism. Then you go to verse 34. Now when they brought him into his house, 
he set him before them and he rejoiced. Right there you have him rejoicing. That's exactly like uh, the, the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Okay. He rejoiced. He went away rejoicing after he was baptized. Right. So what that tells me is in verse 34, the man believed. And was saved because he had uh, he had the the proof of that by his rejoicing he he was regenerated, okay him and all his household. So I'm asking, how how can you say that it's belief only? I'll let you answer that. How can you say that it's belief only when earlier you said that you believed plus prayed? Okay. Did you repent? Did <laughs> all you right. do what? All right, so, Chad. Uh, I appreciate you calling in. I'm gonna let him answer your question, and uh, I appreciate it. We're just. We're actually kind of over the time, so didn't mean to cut you off, but I agree with all. Oh, it's okay. I'll hang up and let y'all, and I'll just watch and let y'all talk about okay. it. Okay. All right. Well, I think Chad is twisting my words a little bit there. I did not say belief plus pray. And then if you look in, back at the beginning of their interaction with the jailer here, he believed them or else he would not do the things that they said that Jesus commanded to do. So and in verse 34, when it says believing in God, this isn't a starting to believing. It's just describing the attitude that he had as he rejoiced. So I'll leave, I'll leave with that. All right. Well, again, we're getting ready to wrap this up. I do appreciate all the calls, and we even had some we had to turn away with here at, at the very end. But we've been on for a while, and I know Tim's got a long drive to get back to Nashville. We're going to go ahead and start closing uh, closing statements. I think we said five. And, minutes. and there was a, someone that just texted right there. If if uh, we got five minutes closing, so if you actually want to call during my five minutes, you can call and ask your question if you choose to. Are you fine with that? Say that again. Someone texted and said I had a question about denominations. We have five minutes, so I'm saying in my five minutes. You you fine with them say whatever, in? whatever you want in your five minutes. But I don't know who, know who it is. It might be someone holding your view. Hey, if that's how you want to spend your five minutes, I'm good. Yeah. I'm going to save my five minutes, and I got I do got to get back across the state. Okay, let me go ahead and start it. I'll go over here. Oh, well, you're supposed to go first. But oh, fine. okay. All right, all right, all right. That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. All right, my closing statement. All right. Okay, thanks everybody for watching, for hanging with us over the past two and a half hours. I have a lot of admiration for Travis and his ability to recall scripture uh, quickly. I'm jealous of that. So thank you all again for your attention this evening, and thanks to Travis again for inviting me out. There's just a few things I hope you take away from tonight's debate. You've heard tonight accusations from Travis about man-made churches and Christ establishing his church in the New Testament. But as I've demonstrated, Travis's own church cannot stand up to meet the method by which he judges these other denominations. Unless Travis completely admits that Christ's church fell away for centuries because he can't point to any other church or any other individual and confidently affirm them as Christian. Travis and his religious tradition does more to divide the body of Christ than he does to unify it, contrary to his claims. As I stated in my opening, I have unity and Christian fellowship with my brothers and sisters that fear the triune God, that recognize Scripture as their sole infallible rule of faith, and that have been saved by grace through faith. There is diversity in Christ's body. While Travis demands compulsion and compliance in a way not unlike that of the Catholic Church, you see, Christ quotes Deuteronomy 6.4 and says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The word for one there is ehad, which means to have a compound unity, a unity in diversity. The word ehad is also used when Jesus quotes Genesis 2.24, where men shall leave, their, leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall be one ehad flesh. Christ's body is one, and it is a compound unity. As we saw earlier, looking at the differences of the Gentile churches with the church in Jerusalem in Acts 21, which is a major problem for Travis. Next, and again to contrary Travis tradition, whether he admits it or not, the church, the bride of Christ, has never fallen away, needing a restoration to the earth. Through Roman persecution under Nero that lasted almost four centuries, the church prevailed. Through the dark ages and under the tyranny of the Pope, in every tavern, jailhouse, university, or home where individuals trusted Christ for their salvation and not their own works, there the church stood. To the 20th and 21st centuries in persecuted China where believers are so desperate for God's word, some even hand copy scripture a chapter at a time. There the church prevails. You see, Travis believes these hand copyists 
could carefully copy the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, and especially John, and still wouldn't have what they need to be saved. Travis's true plan of salvation is not laid out coherently anywhere in Scripture. That is his five points there. They're never together. He must piece them together. Lastly, and listen to me carefully here, there is rest in Christ. Christ says in Matthew 11, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is that truly what Travis believes? Like I said before, there is a lot Travis thinks he must do. You see, obedience is important. I've been baptized. I read my Bible. I go to church. I strive to lead a repentant lifestyle. But none of that is a burden that I must bear in order to merit my salvation. Law-keeping has never earned anyone a place in heaven. Any good work that I do or any true believer does in, is in reaction to what Christ has already done for me. And what did Christ do? While we were still sinners, a people worthy of death and damnation, Christ came down from heaven and took on flesh, a second and better Adam. He lived a perfect life that you and I cannot live, perfectly obeying God's law at every moment. It was on the cross that while Christ deserved none of it and we deserved all of it, that he stepped into our place. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we may become the righteousness of God. So that all who put faith and trust in him, which is a hope in things not seen, according to Hebrews 1.11, we will have eternal life. Thank you. All right, Travis. I'll take a couple minutes here if you want to elaborate, if you have a question. Caller. Hey, Travis. How you doing? Good. You doing okay? I'm doing good. Uh, I got a question for both of you gentlemen. Well, this the question and answers is kind of off. He's actually packing up, but if you want to if you want to ask your question, uh, I'll try to answer it. Uh, I, I've been doing a little study on church history myself, and I found out that since the Protestant, the Reformation, or the Restoration movements, we've ended up with over thirty thousand different Christian denominations. Meanwhile, overseas, there's places like the Ethiopian church that was formed in the third century. They have the oldest complete Bible on the face of the earth, and they've been practicing Christianity the same way since the third century. Okay. Why didn't anybody check with them and see what their beliefs are okay. and quit all this denominational arguments? Okay, I agree with you. We need to get rid of denominations. If you don't care, text me your resource. I'd be interested in looking into that, but I've got to let you go. I've got to wrap up. Thanks for watching. All right. Have a blessed evening. You too. All right, you know, uh, just to close out, I do appreciate him coming in here uh, and trying to promote, uh, well, trying to promote faith only, but he's not going to promote it because it's not in the Bible. As he said, I want you to think about some of the arguments he said. He said Travis's, Travis's church and their plan of salvation is not one place in the Bible, but it's in the Bible. So maybe he actually admits it's just different scriptures in the Bible. But you know what, friends? His faith only isn't even in from Genesis to the book of Revelation. You know, so I mean, I mean, I don't understand. I don't think sometimes you guys who call in or Baptist reform, you actually think of your own arguments. Like he said too, the church, uh, he doesn't believe that it had fallen away. Well, I personally doesn't, I don't believe that it went to totally out of existence, but even if you did believe that or you didn't, you couldn't prove it because none of us can go back to time. But I will show you this. I will show you what the Apostle Paul mentioned in First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Look at this. The Bible says there's going to be a falling away. Now, that's clear. There was a falling away. And 
uh, I mean, I don't know how you can't just read your New Testament and see that even Paul, he warns the elders in Acts chapter 20 that there's going to be a falling away with even within the body of Christ. So yes, there was a falling away, but his arguments doesn't prove anything. He can't find, he actually got up here and said the Baptist church is not the church of Christ. It doesn't really matter if you're a Baptist or not. Then why is he doing it? He's just actually saying it's unessential. See, denominations are, they're not essential. They're all the same. That one is good as another because there's, there's no salvation in a denomination. Why? But I went through, friends. If you look, they deny the blood. They deny salvation. I mean, even the caller calls in another Baptist and he didn't even, he couldn't even imply and see that Abraham had obeyed in Hebrews 11, 8. And because, why? Why, why is he doing that? Because he's prejudiced. See, they want to believe Genesis 15, 6, that you're saved by faith only, and that's it. Well, we're not taking any other calls. If you're watching this, this is my closing statement. If you want to call a, uh, maybe this Sunday night on Truth With Proof, I'll make a link. You guys can call in, whoever didn't get to call in. If you disagreed with me, you can call in then, and we will discuss on Truth With Proof this Sunday night, Lord willing, you'll see the link. And if it's okay with you, Tim, do you care if I do review? No, y'all Okay, well, Tom didn't want me to do a review, and then later he said that's fine, so I didn't even fool with him. And I'd like to review some of the things he stated. I wonder if he was still, I wonder if Tim would still call me a Campbellite, or would he research, and now he's going to call me maybe uh, the, the, the Fisher name, the, the Fro Foster. It was Foster's that I showed that were before Alexander Campbell. How about he just call me a Christian because I'm doing what the Bible says. So love you guys. Love Tim. Appreciate his encouragement coming out. I wish many other people had the zeal he had. We're getting ready to close out. Time is out. Appreciate all the viewers. If you stuck with us for two hours, Tim, you want to come up here and we'll shake hands and you tell him goodbye. And I don't hate his guts and I don't think he's going to eat me. I didn't turn you out. I didn't turn you into him. All right. I appreciate All right. you. All right. <clears throat>